morning, Austin. Good morning. We are calling to order meeting number 271 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission on May 29, 2019 at 9, 30, uh, 10 a.m. at our offices at 101 Federal Street here in Boston. We're going to begin with item number two. Commissioner Stebbins, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning. In front of you have the meeting from the May 22nd, 2019 minutes. Uh, I would move their approval uh, with one addendum, uh, had a conversation with the chair, and what I'd like to do is go back uh, under the conversation about the alcohol beverages and insert some language from the trans transcript with respect to the conversation we had around distance to parking and security for folks that were walking to uh, parking so we can make that a formal part of the adopted minutes. I think Commissioner Brian spoke to that as, as well. I, uh, mine was a little more specific to the bottom of page five, the reference to what I had asked of IEB. It was not a general request on input. It was specifically their historical experience with MGM's two to four alcohol service. So I just asked them to reflect that at the bottom of page five. Okay. I, I, I just had a very small one, but um, but I'd still like to reflect on page seven when I met when I um, in the almost last paragraph. Um, I thank Mr. Desalvio and Ms. Crum for their work um, in keeping the commission informed, but also for the work they're doing in, in getting the casino on time. So it's not just for their information, but for their work. I second. Aye. 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 <clears throat> Item number three, please. Our administrative update from Executive Director Petrosian. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. So I have two updates, a general update and a staffing update. I'll start with the general update. I am uh, uh, pleased to tell you that the Encore opening um, is uh, going at a hectic but controlled pace. Uh, thanks to our lead <coughs> gaming agent on the property, Louis Lozano and his team, all the slots have been verified and sealed with state seals. Um, there are about six of them who were still having some challenges communicating with the NOC, but we had anticipated getting that resolved relatively quickly. I've talked to Scott Helwig in our gaming technology department. So that's a good place. And that's not just, uh, to be clear, that's not just the work of our folks. That's work of the Encore folks who cooperate with us on that also. So that was a, uh, a great team effort. We will now turn our attention, the gaming agents will, to table games. Um, and they would expect that they could get table games verified all in about a week. Um, so we're right on schedule. Uh, in addition, uh, with our gaming agents and uh, Mr. Curtis from licensing, we will work on alcohol inspections. We have a great relationship with ABCC. We're doing a walkthrough with the Encore staff and ABCC later next week in anticipation of opening also. Um, so uh, Mr. Ziemba, and Mr. Delaney are working very hard on commitments. I was over at the property with them yesterday and they stayed after I left to work on uh, making sure all the commitments are verified and that. Um, I think all this will be reflected in a meeting I, I anticipate having before you next week in which the directors in their specific areas um, will come and tell you um, what has been done and what might still be outstanding needed to be done in the weeks leading up to opening. Um, so, uh, I would say in general we're in a good spot, but there is a lot of work and a lot of documentation to get to the commission. Um, and it's, uh, we can do it, but it's going to take uh, everyone's uh, effort and cooperation. The Encore folks have been terrific in that cooperation, so thank you to them. Uh, I do have a little bit of an anecdote. I was walking around the property yesterday and I walked into uh, Rare, which is the steakhouse. And uh, there was a, a woman dressed in a server's uniform. And uh, she walked up to me. We were talking about the condition of the property. Um, 
and she asked me what I did, and I explained I was with the Gaming com Commission and what our responsibilities were, and I asked her what she did. I assumed she was a server within Rare. Turns out she was a banquet server. And um, in conversation, she said, you know, ever since I voted for the casino in Everett, um, I've been looking forward to it. So I said, oh, you're a Everett resident. She says, I am an Everett resident. And it, and it turns out that she has been a banquet server at most of the major hotels in Boston and the seaport. Um, and she couldn't contain her enthusiasm about having a job in her backyard um, and being, uh, you know, really excited. She even said, you know, I had a four o'clock, um, I don't know what the term is, but she had to show up at four o'clock. And she said, I woke up at three o'clock and I was all in. I was, it was great. So, um, so she was. 4 a.m.? She, 4 a.m., she said. So, <laughs> and. Uh, what kind of banquet is that? Yeah. <laughs> I, early breakfast. Yeah, an early meeting that uh, day. But she was, uh, you know, super enthusiastic. And, uh, you know, I know that's just an anecdote, but it was, uh, it was certainly the, the person I ran into that day. Yeah. And it was a, uh, it was a nice anecdote. So, um, speaking of happy employees, uh, I'd like to introduce, uh, tell you about some of our staff who's grown since I have done the last of these, which is was is in uh, February of last year. So I'm going to give you the list of our new employees, some of whom are here, many of whom are gaming agents and are out doing exactly what I just described. But uh, let me start with someone you've probably seen here at these meetings for a while, uh, David Bumpus, who's sitting right over here. Um, is our new digital communications coordinator. He started in April of this year. Welcome, David. Austin. 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 I'm sorry. Da well, it's, I'm sorry. It, it's da it's David Austin. We go. It's the we, legal name. We do. We go with. We go with legal names. <laughs> Two months I've been calling him by the wrong name. Yeah. <laughs> An imposter. <laughs> da. There we go. All right, David, that's a free we, lunch. We have, <laughs> we, we have had the um, uh, luxury of getting to know Austin well, so yep. thank you, Austin. Uh, Vivian Showell, who we see out front. Thank you, Vivian. Excellent. And another official welcome. Everybody. That's right. Um, and a recent uh, uh, hire, Noelle Lowe, who's a senior revenue accountant. Noelle, there she is. Noelle. Excellent. Um, let me do a couple more who are here, and then I'll do the gaming agents. Um, Matt Jordan is a new financial investigator. Uh, Matt hails from Alaska, so he came to us from Alaska. He came here so, for the weather, I think. Yeah, just a, just a little little bit of a change. So welcome, Matt. Tamarin O'Connor, who is an IT operations coordinator. Oh, there she yeah. is behind the pole. Thank you. Nice to meet you. And finally, the last one here is Connor McCourt, who is a licensing specialist one. Honor and those folks have been working really hard to get our licensing done for Encore. So thank you, Connor. Um, for gaming agents, we have David Diorio, Mary Porter, Diane Podolak, um, uh, Matthew Kelly, James Morell, Joseph Ford, Martin Edwards, Colin McGahan, and Sean Murphy. For supervising gaming agents, we have David Diorio, Mary Porter, Jolene Bingham and Darren Fenske. So uh, that's obviously a lot of folks. Um, we've been ramping up for the additional Region A responsibility, and I think that's also reflected in that. Um, the other thing you probably know about is we've um, expanded our game enforcement unit with the state police and also this time with Everett Police. Um, so we have a combined unit of state troopers and Everett folks who are and were on the property yesterday and continue will be on the property now 24-7. Um, so that's a uh, another um, uh, uh, good um, uh, work with the Everett Police. Many of us, many of us who were in law enforcement in the past know some of the Everett folks, including the chief. So it's a, it's a, it's a long relationships. So I think that'll be a, uh, a, a, a great thing for us. Ed, do you have the numbers by chance to break down? City and state. Yeah, I, I so I, I think it's twelve and six. Yeah, I think it's twelve and six with uh, Lieutenant Tim Babin being the um, the uh, GU uh, lieutenant for that for the Encore property. You may remember Tim started in Springfield, moved here, and uh, Ronnie Gibbons ended up. Uh, he was a sergeant at Springfield's now lieutenant ended up backfilling out in Springfield. 
think Tim started in Plainridge and then moved to MGM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he did. He did so start exactly. Right. So, so great. Uh, yeah. So uh, the good news is our senior management has that depth of experience. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I think the overall message is um, both our preparations for the opening of Encore and our staffing for the opening of Encore um, are on schedule. Um, but it will still be a lot of work, and I hope you will see that reflected in the presentation next week. That's all I have. Thank you. Well, we'd like to extend a warm welcome to all our newcomers. Um, we thank you for being part of this team and hope that it's a, a warm and comfortable welcome for you. And for those who have been engaged, like Vivian, um, I know that you're enjoying yourself, and that smile shows it every day. Um, and we, we thank you for your service. So thank you. And Austin, we'll keep in mind the two names. <laughs> All righty. Um, just a clarification, Janice, are we staying on course right now? Okay. Um, we are going to move an um, uh, item that was originally um, enumerated as number seven on our agenda up front to accommodate um, our, our visitors. So uh, we'll start with Director Griffin, please, on Workforce, Fire, and Diversity Development, and welcome our, our Encore friends. Good morning, Bob. Good morning. Good morning, Chairwoman and Commissioners. Good morning. <laughs> so I'm joined today by Bob DeSalvio and his team. I'm actually going to let him introduce uh, his team, and then I have some introductory remarks. Sure. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Thank you for the time this morning. We are uh, very pleased to be here to present um, the overall regional uh, and what turns out to be a worldwide and international marketing uh, plan. And I am uh, joined today, my far right, Danielle Ashurst, um, who is our Assistant Director of Travel Industry Sales, and Joan Esnault, who is our Executive Director of Hotel Sales and Catering uh, for the presentation. And then also, I think Martha Sheridan is on her way over. Uh, Martha is the President and CEO of the Greater Boston Convention and Visitors Bureau and will be stopping by as well. Um, and so she's been an important part of the equation for us. And good morning, Jackie. And Jackie. Yes. <laughs> um, so uh, by way of background, the regional marketing plan submitted by Encore Boston Harbor is intended to fulfill pre-opening requirements of license condition 15. Um, in addition to other requirements in Chapter 23K. Um, condition 15 requires um, the licensee to produce a regional tourism and marketing plan in consultation with the Regional Tourism Council and the Mass Office of uh, Travel and Tourism, subject uh, to approval by the Commission, of course. Um, and uh, the plan, um, includes but is not limited to making space available in the gaming establishment for state and regional tourism information. Um, on the website, uh, a joint marketing program with the Regional Tourism Council and MOT, um, staff training in regards to the plan and the sharing of visitors' um, data um, to the Tourism Council. Um, the plan was required um, to be provided to the commission um, at least 90 days prior to the anticipated um, commencement of operations of the gaming establishment. And um, Encore um, satisfied this requirement. Um, um, Section 3, License Condition <laughs> 4, referred to business development, including um, in recognition of the unique cultural, historical, and entertainment attractions located in the city of Boston and throughout the region, Wynn shall develop and maintain a proprietary concierge program for the purpose of cross-marketing these attractions. And I think you've seen some of these um, requirements illustrated in the plan. As you are 
at all aware, um, tourism promotion is um, an important part of Chapter 23K <coughs> as well. Um, and this is evidenced in Section 1, uh, Area 6, which states promoting local small businesses and the tourism industry, including the development of new and existing small businesses and tourism amenities such as lodging, dining, retail, cultural and social facilities is fundamental to the policy objectives of this chapter. Um, so um, I won't go on. Um, some of the other requirements are in the memo, but I did want to outline the process that staff and the Encore um, underwent. Um, we received, staff received the first version um, of the plan, the draft, on March 7th. And um, uh, I met, I had several meetings regarding the plan with Martha Sheridan, president of the Greater Boston Convention and Visitors Bureau, um, and with Assistant Secretary for Business Development and International Trade, Nam Pham, um, and the newly appointed Executive Director of Mass Office of Travel and Tourism, Oral. Um, and Encore, based on the feedback provided from uh, this group, submitted a revised version of the plan on March 24th. And um, commissioners, uh, no vote is planned today for the plan, uh, but instead planned for uh, the June 12th. And so with those comments, unless you have questions, I'll turn it back. Any questions? <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you again. We have um, divided the plan really into three different sections. Um, and Danielle's going to uh, start in just a moment with the how we invite the world to visit Massachusetts. Um, then Joan has a, a, a section that really talks about sharing the best of Massachusetts with the rest of the world. And then I'm going to jump in at the end and talk about infrastructure because it takes quite a bit for this to happen um, by way of property and regional infrastructure. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Danielle for the first section. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commission. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you for having us. And it is my pleasure to uh, represent Encore Boston Harbor internationally. Um, our philosophy as a company is to look at regional tourism with a global approach. So we're very excited to go out into the world and not only present Encore Boston Harbor with this amazing state of Massachusetts and everything that guests can do while they're here with us. We're very excited to, to get out there and um, promote this amazing state and region. Uh, first, we'll start with utilizing our global network. Uh, between our properties in Las Vegas and in Macau, we've got a database of over 10 million brand loyalists. So we are able to market to them as often as we like, and our newest property has uh, been very palatable to the guests that have enjoyed our properties in both Las Vegas and Macau. And so we do have uh, some representation in some of the markets as well. So as you can see, we have representation in California, Canada, and throughout Asia, which is quite a large market for us to really push uh, the efforts of Encore Boston Harbor and get people excited about the state of Massachusetts. I've been out a lot. Uh, the response I always get is, oh, I love Boston. When's the last time you've been here? I re the more I talk about experiences here that guests can have, the more excited folks get. And then the fact that we've got something familiar for them with Encore Boston Harbor, they're very, very, very excited to come visit us. Another way we're able to use, utilize our network is our WIN magazine. This magazine is not only in all of the guest rooms, so every single guest that stays in any of our resorts will have complete access to the WIN magazine, and of course we'll be featuring the opening of Encore Boston Harbor. And this magazine is solely to not only promote the resorts, but also the locations that the resorts are in. So Boston will be a large focus for us moving forward, and of course we'll showcase what we've got on site, but maybe showing where our boats will take the guests to as well through the city and having some dining tips outside of uh, what your normal expectations are and giving some hidden gems uh, for the region. So we're very excited to present this. And uh, for anybody in the audience, next time you're in the airport, pick one up at Hudson News. We've got it there as well. Uh -huh. 
So globally sourced entertainment is my favorite. We do some really amazing activities on property. Uh, my favorite being the Lunar New Year or more notably known as Chinese New Year. Uh, throughout all of our properties in Las Vegas, Macau, and here um, in Encore Boston Harbor, we're very excited to do the Dragon Dance, which is an over-the-top experience for guests to come in. So we do have guests from all over the world, and it's incredibly important for us to share and to celebrate different cultures. So we're excited for the Lunar New Year Dance, Brazilian Independence. We'll, we'll have a Diwali celebration, of course, St. Patty's Day. Um, and Cinco de Mayo is on there. Not Mexican independence, but we do celebrate both. So Mexican Independence Day is actually September 16th. And we do a large um, celebration for Mexican Independence Day as well. So very excited to not only bring cultures together, but highlight some of the great cultures that our guests um, are very proud of. And maybe our guests, while they're in-house, will learn something new about a culture they weren't familiar with. I should say that that's, a, that's something that often gets confused, by the way. The yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mayo and Mexico in the yes. <laughs> so I out. had to I had to point that out. <laughs> uh, so we here at Encore Boston Harbor. My my position um, is again to to promote um, tourism domestically and internationally. But I'm one person. I've got myself and one other one other team member. So we as a company have continued with our sister properties in joining uh, preferred hotels and resorts. Preferred Hotels and Resorts is a representation company and they represent us on six different continents. We're still working on Antarctica. But every single, <laughs> every single major city has a Preferred Hotels and Resorts representation person and office. And right now their sole focus is Encore Boston Harbor and Boston. We will actually have the president um, and CEO of Preferred Hotels and Resorts next week and to check out the site and come and experience Boston so that way as they're going out and speaking with their team members they'll have a full experience as well. Um, there is a list of where some of the cities are a very very large present in Asia but also throughout Europe, South America, Canada, Mexico and then of course here in the States. Personally um, I am able to go out and travel with uh, preferred hotels and resorts and this year I've been to four continents and we're only to June. So it's a really, really great uh, opportunity to have some folks in market to get me in front of the right people to do mass presentations uh, to discuss uh, this property in this beautiful region. Red card. So if you've been to a Bruins game, the Celtics game, uh, 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 gotten to the, the Sox uh, games at Fenway, you might see our big red card booth, which red card just builds our brand loyalty. We have been a company since um, the early 2000s, first opening in April 2005 as Wynn Resorts, and our red card has constantly um, engaged our guests to be a part of our culture. So red card is gaming focused, so the minute guests come in, whether they spend a dollar or a thousand dollars, they could be a part of our red, program, red card program, and they'll receive offers for the property, and of course, big focus on, on Boston. So we will be sending out marketing offers to our database of 10 million um, and growing and get everyone excited about this new project and, uh, and uh, location that we're in. And lastly, I want to introduce you to familiar, familiarization trips. So familiarization trips invite influencers, discerning clientele, and travel professionals into the location of the resort and familiarize them with everything we have to offer. So an example of a FAM trip in the industry, we call it a FAM. Uh, we would invite guests in for a site tour of the resort and then a breakfast, lunch, or dinner, and then an off-site activity. So we've already had a lot of fun um, going to events around the city and duck tours and presenting uh, Boston um, as, a, as a new city for this resort. And what it does is a lot of people think when we open up a hotel, we just sell the hotel. But we sell the destination first because the guest has got to want to come to Boston and then we'll let them figure out where they'd like to lay their heads. But at the end of the day, there's no greater passion than going out, selling this great city, letting everybody be excited about it, and then say, well, I've got killer hotel rooms as well. <laughs> so what we do is we invite our travel and professionals to come out, really experience, immerse themselves in this market, and then they can go back out to wherever they come from in the world 
and sell it to their guests from a first-hand experience because I guarantee you, you will take a recommendation from a friend before you will a stranger. Mm -hmm. So they go out into their own markets and they do a really great job, so we look forward to hearing that. Thank you, Danielle. And now I'm going to turn it over to Joan, who's going to talk about sharing the best of Massachusetts with the world. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. Good morning. Um, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I do want to continue with the, the tourism campaign and talking about how our goal is to create, of course, memorable experiences for our guests, not only in the resort, but of course in the Boston and the region and, and across the state. Um, so this plan will outline some of those initiatives. We know that when guests come and stay at our resort, they're not just staying here, they're staying two or three nights. So we know they're not going to just, even though there's lots to do there, that they're also going to explore Boston in the region and we want them to and we encourage them and as Danielle said as we go out on the road we're selling the destination first and then the resort uh, we understand the importance of supporting the local businesses uh, and experience and having the guest experience and explore all of these businesses as well so the grand opening marketing campaign um, uh, introduces Boston Harbor as something completely new and different for New England and, and in my role, I, I've also gone out on the road quite a bit and with Martha's, some of Martha's, in, uh, Martha is here <laughs> from the Boston CVB. And uh, we've uh, teamed up with her team and done domestic shows, client events, where we introduce Boston as well. So we've really partnered very well together in going out on the road. Um, this, this, this property is truly unique to Boston, as you know. Uh, meeting planners are thrilled to hear about this, that there's something new and different. And this truly is a demand generator. We have a, a, a meeting planner now that are, are headquartered here in Boston, and they're actually, they've never held their convention here. Um, they've always held it at the Wynn Las Vegas because they're too large for most of the hotels here. But once they heard we were coming here, they were th so thrilled, and for the first time, they'll be holding their event here in September. So. And of course, they're bringing about four or 500 people and it will be ready for them to explore Boston as well. Um, I believe we actually only have, we have the only pairing of a major city in a major, major five-star luxury resort. Uh, there, there really isn't another city, when you think about it, in the country that has this type of a five-star casino resort in a major city outside of Las Vegas. Uh, I don't know if that's really a major city, but um, of the major cities, there really isn't when you think about it, and our meeting planners are telling us this too as well. Um, we have also just completed a TV commercial airing next week, uh, which will be um, kind of a uh, teaser campaign for us. Uh, we just finished shooting that yesterday. So the grand opening marketing campaign is a mil multi-million dollar grand opening campaign, which consists of TV, print, radio, outdoor, digital, and paid social. It actually starts June 10th. It'll cover some of these feeder markets that you see here, the Cape, Providence, Newport, Portsmouth, Manchester, Worcester, uh, Hartford, uh, and then even in the outlying areas in New York and Westchester. So we're really trying to obviously get outside of this, uh, this regional area as well. Um, also on June 21st, we're ha holding what's called a media day, and we'll have about two to three hundred media from domestic uh, that will be focused on New York, Chicago, LA, and regionally that are coming in to tour the property, um, and also hold a news conference with Bob and answer some questions. And then on the 22nd, uh, Martha and her team are, are, are going to show them, a, give them a, a tour of Boston as well. And then on the 23rd of July. Uh, we, we're looking to have the uh, Japanese media join us for uh, a, another tour as well. So we're, we're also uh, have some outreach to the international media. Um, as far as booking the, re uh, the resort, uh, it really starts pre before they even come to Encore Boston Harbor as an experience. Um, we have 19 reservations agents that are trained on the Boston region very well uh, on their offerings. We have weekly fact sheets that the concierge uh, works with to, to train them and um, uh, give them all of the facts about the, uh, the area as well as restaurant uh, 
offerings, so they have a whole list. Uh, we also have a link to the Massachusetts Office of Travel and Tourism, as well as the Boston CVB uh, link that are both on our website. So the, all the facts are, uh, are, are there during the reservation process in case any questions come up and we can answer those and help them find all kinds of things to do outside of the resort as well. Um, also, Martha has uh, uh, offered to facilitate some training with our folks uh, in the reservation center as well as the front office. So uh, thank you, Martha, for, <laughs> for, uh, for uh, offering to do this and, uh, and train them as to some of the sites as well. <clears throat> we have quite a, uh, an, an um, extensive concierge services as well. Mark Simeo. He's been in the industry about 23 years. He's our chief concierge. And I don't know if you've ever heard of this um, organization, but we have uh, nine concierge professionals, but three of them, actually three of them, represent uh, an organization called Clay, Lay Clay Door, which it means co golden, the golden keys, and it's the ability to open doors. It's a very um, elite organization. You have to have many years of service, uh, comprehensive testing and prove beyond the, beyond a doubt that you really uh, understand the service and the quality. So um, it's a it's a very high standards for our guests, and we're really very excited to be able to showcase uh, the city with the with these concierge folks. They are also a member of the Greater Boston Concierge Association, which they attend their monthly meetings. Um, and then when they come back, they will have depart interdepartmental meetings and uh, review all of the, uh, the details and uh, new, new, uh, new findings about Boston. Boston. And uh, they have developed strong relationships also with the Massachusetts um, Chambers of Commerce. <clears throat> three of your nine. What's that? Three of your nine. Yes. Three of the nine are part of that, this really elite organization, yes. But all of them do attend the um, the association uh, meetings. I think it's just great that there's an opportunity for them to excel and exactly. really develop uh, professionally. Yeah. That's, that's tremendous. And they're, they're also responsible for cross-training the call center and the front office representatives with local and regional knowledge. We'll have also what's called ambassadors besides the concierge that are out roaming uh, in our lobby, and anyone that stops and we can ask questions. Uh, we don't really have kiosks because we're a five-star service, and we really want that personalized service with our guests. So we actually w want to talk to them rather than say, go over to a kiosk. So we want to find out what they're looking for and really personalize that service. As far as partnerships with area restaurants, uh, I think you've for Fratelli Restaurant Group, we have uh, that North End Restaurant, Fratelli's Between Brothers, and Frank D. Pasquale was, uh, and Nick Carano have partnered together in uh, opening up this fabulous North End Restaurant in, uh, in our resort. Uh, we've also partnered with Big Night Entertainment Group, Randy Greenstein and Ed and Joe Kane, and of course I'm sure you're familiar with their, prop, uh, with their, um, with their facilities, the Scorpion Bar, Red Lantern, and Empire. We'll have Mystique which is a similar to Empire with an Asian uh, cuisine fusion and that open concept kitchen. Uh, and then Memoir, which is a, a really fun nightclub as well. We also will uh, be partnering with a lot of the local food vendors and, and businesses. Warren Richards and our executive chef, Joe Liebowitz, are from the Wynn Las Vegas. And they have been here for over two years and really have immersed themselves into the community to partner with a lot of these local food uh, businesses, such as Island Creek Oysters, which we'll serve in our uh, oyster bar, um, Iggy's Bread, New England Charcuterie. So there's a whole list here. Um, and they continue to, to expand on that list and uh, uh, to grow that partnership. And it's very important that we do this. That, that was going to be my question. So this will be an ongoing effort. Absolutely. Absolutely. Excellent. And along with the food, uh, there's a beverage program uh, that we are supporting through our partnerships. The Lord Hobo is working hand in hand with our with our uh, Encore Boston Harbor. They actually have created a, a, a New England style beer specifically for our property that they will 
uh, package and sell to, uh, in retail st stores after we open as well. And, and what is that going to be called? Do you know? Is that the Lord? I don't know what the name of it is of yet, but they are working on that. <laughs> I'm sure they'll come up with some uh, unique names. Then there's Boston Harbor Distillery and Privateer Rum, uh, which is located in Ipswich. On the next page is just continued with some more of the local craft brews that we are partnering with. Our Pone, Sam Adams, and we'll be serving all of these local beers in our, in our uh, uh, venues. Partnership also with Boston Harbor Now, which is to promote the accessibility along the harbor front. Jim Folk, I'm sure you know him, he's our Executive Director of Transportation. He's on the advisory board. Um, they've been a very big help to us in um, designing the wonderful amenity of the harbor walk that goes around the property. We're very excited to, have, uh, to showcase that to the public. Um, they've worked very hard with us on the environmental findings and provided guidance and they've conducted, we've conducted a water transportation uh, study with them as well. We'll have most of the regularly scheduled votes uh, that go into the Seaport and Financial District, which I know Bob is gonna talk about in a little while. We have a partnership with the Mystic River Watershed Association, um, which is a vision of connecting 25 miles of bike and pedestrian pathways. Eric Hansen is the Chief Sustainability Officer uh, on our team who is on the board of directors with the Watershed Association. Um, they've conducted regional Mystic Greenways Vision, creating more accessibility around the Mystic River. Um, they've come up with a, a, the Living Shoreline, if you're familiar with that, and that is on our property. So, and, and that's uh, coming along very nicely as well. The vision is to develop the future plans for the parks, pedestrians, paths, uh, bike routes, accessibility, and engage in thousands of uh, community members to, to, uh, to showcase this. Developing plans through this study can support the future development that will be well received by the community. Sports venues, as you might imagine, sports uh, are, are aligns well with our customer demographic. Therefore, we're, we're partnered with some of the uh, wonderful Boston sports teams and we also have uh, contracts for suites at uh, TD Garden, Gillette Stadium, and Fenway Park, uh, where we are often uh, entertain customers. I know for my staff and meetings and conventions, we have taken, uh, we've used it a couple times already. And the uh, at Fenway, we can bring a, we bring in about 35, 40 of the meeting planners and entertain. And it's a great way to network and and showcase the city as well. We engage in the Bruins sponsorship uh, also with the Stanley Cup where we sponsored the entertainment light show. Uh, another great membership that we have, of course, is with the Boston Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we sponsor their annual dinner and um, uh, meeting and dinner. And Bob DeSalvio is co-chair of the Hospitality and Tourism Leadership Council. Bob attends quarterly meetings. Uh, he's, um, they, they bring in speakers on various industry uh, topics and of course one of the important ones is uh, transportation. Other members, uh, memberships that we are um, participate in are on the next page. Um, other chambers, Everett, Malden, Somerville, uh, Chelsea. John Taco, who is our Executive Director of Government and Community Relations, is on the board uh, for the Everett Chamber and very involved with that chamber as you might imagine. And we're, start, we're getting more involvement with the other chambers as well as we uh, as we move along other membership statewide tourism the encore we're um, in discussions with the mass office of travel and tourism so you mentioned Kiko Oral who's the executive director Annie Maloney the chief of staff and Maria Spir Spiridakos who's the director of international public relations they've all come out to the property we gave them a, a tour and I've been in uh, contact with Keiko and uh, she's in the process now, she's new as you know, and she's developing her um, strategic plan. And we're going to get together on June 17th and discuss that plan with her and how we can partnership on certain initiatives. And of course, Martha, with the Boston uh, Convention Center and Visitors Bureau, along with the Boston Convention and Marketing Center, as we, I had mentioned before, we have uh, an 
engaged with them on many of the client visits, uh, client uh, events, and trade shows as we go around the country and even internationally. We just uh, came back from Frankfurt from a big trade show that was out there. Uh, and in the fall, we do a Barcelona. So we really are international as well as domestic. Um, and also, we, uh, Danielle is on the committee for the Chinese Marketing Committee as well. As well, uh, and we also are working. Um, we we have taken out some ads in some of the um, local the destination guide as well, since we know that goes out to uh, um, thousands of meeting planners. Uh, partnership on the regional tourism board. Um, there is Greater Merrimack Valley Convention and Visitors Bureau, in the north of Boston Convention and Visitors Bureau. We are in the process of joining. We've been speaking with them. And uh, they are actually sending out an introductory email uh, for us next week to their 1,000 membership for the uh, North of Boston Convention Bureau. And we are setting up uh, tours with them and meeting with their staff and seeing how we can partner better together as well. For the neighborhood organizations, the Friends of the Navy Yard, which is to improve the quality of life for the residents and businesses and visitors in the uh, Charleston area, uh, along with the Gihau Oak Tin Oak Association, which is a community group in Chinatown that we support their efforts as well. We've entered into a gift certificate program as part of our uh, commitment, and um, we, will have a, we will purchase $125,000 worth of gift certificates uh, from the cities of Everett, Malden, Medford, and Somerville. And we're in the process of selecting those restaurants and entities that we will have certificates from. And these certificates are to um, provide to your customers? Yeah. Correct. So yes. that they can... And, yes. and our employees. Uh, the We Save program for local businesses, uh, we're partnering with the, to, so that we can offer opportunities to provide discounts to our employees. So uh, actually this is great for the local businesses because they get to be in front of 5,000 employees and, and offer their services and products. Uh, we're in process of obtaining these businesses right now and, and gathering up uh, what those discounts will be. We've already secured some, Boston Sports Club, Carter's Day Cleaners, Daryl's Corner Bar and Kitchen. So we have a whole list and that'll be an ongoing process as well. Is, is there a, uh, a way to help small businesses in the area understand what your expectations might be for that we say program so that they're not ready when you come visit they can kind of oh, move it, to a position absolutely, absolutely. yeah martin Tennant them. is in our um, he's our director of learning and um, he's played an active role along with the human resources group and along with john taco to go out and really try to promote the buying power of these five thousand team members they will spend you know and and since right now the major concentration uh, uh are all local I think the last number I saw was something in the range of 85% were really fairly close in. Um, the buying power of those folks with local businesses will be extremely strong. So we'll, we'll go out there, we'll work with them. Uh, we, wanna, we want them to present, you know, to give uh, uh, something for the employees by way of some sort of a discount to help encourage it. Um, they all seem very happy to do it. So I think this program will start and then just keep growing over time expected to spread over the years to many businesses. It's, it's actually worked quite well for us um, in Las Vegas. If I could add, um, John Taco presented to um, the Commission's Vendor Advisory Group, and um, chambers and, and cities are very excited about this program because there's a low bar to mm -hmm. entry, there's no cost, right. it's an easy way for them to advertise and get new customers, so there's a lot of excitement about and will there be a way to um, measure the success metrics? It, will the, the local partners be willing to keep track of the foot traffic that they get? Or the there's, a, there's a code that we would have to offer as an employee uh, to access that discount so they'd be able then to track it. See how it's going. That, that would be great. Thank great. you. Um, host and surrounding community best festivals that we also support the Village Fest in Everett and the SS Cosmos and Damien Society Italian Festival. Uh, we've sp sponsored the headlining events for both of these events and of course 
um, encourage attendance and support it very much as well. And I'm sure there's going to be, I know there's lots of festivals and events that go on in Boston, and these are two right now, and I'm sure we'll be uh, participating and sponsoring others. The Massachusetts State Lottery. Um, this week that we've been, we've uh, installed all of the lottery equipment in the building, and uh, if approved, uh, Encore Harbor is, uh, it will expand in, uh, the lottery reach, um, installing eight lottery terminals, I guess, uh, in, in Encore Boston Harbor, uh, but we have installed uh, lottery equipment. Yep. Including, yeah, the Kino, uh, the Kino equipment in the um, on-deck facility as well. They put that in this week. It's going to be on deck. Is that the burger place? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. Mm -hmm. And you've been working with Director Sweeney? Yes. Uh, actually, Jackie Crump has been oh, spearheading the effort with the lottery. It's going quite well. Another partnership that uh, we, we've entered into is with the Museum of Fine Arts. We've sponsored their Toulet uh, Lautrec Le exhibit, and our employees are, you know, we give them free admittance uh, as well as the Everett residents. Other cultural institutions uh, that we share the best of Massachusetts, the Bach Center, Boston's Landmark Orchestra, and the Boston Symphony Orchestra as well, where we sponsor their company of Christmas at Pops. Mm -hmm. So just one question to return to your arts program. Mm -hmm. We had the benefit of a tour during just a few weeks ago mm -hmm. when we were still required to wear construction hats. And we um, met the gentleman who was responsible for the arts program at your facility, which Roger has been highlighted Thomas, recently yes. in the Globe. Your facility alone will be given opportunity to your patrons and other visitors to learn about the art there. And I think you had a plan to maybe institutionalize that with a Absolutely. Tour. Yeah, we're currently working on to start. Um, we're going to do. We're doing a complete inventory of all of the wonderful art. Uh, features within the resort and uh, they'll be cataloged and uh, put into the form of a, a printed piece so that people will be able to go around. Um, I'm hoping one day to expand that further and maybe even do, I'd love to do an audio tour someday uh, that people could either do with an app, um, which would probably be the easiest way to do it. But for now, we're going we're gonna to make sure that, that that book is ready to go and that for those that are interested in the arts, they literally could walk around the property and enjoy it as if it's our own art museum internally. We're waiting for Popeye. Yes, he <laughs> is, right. uh, Popeye is en route. <laughs> when, when, does, when does Popeye uh, looks arrive? like around June 10th or 11th he should uh, be, be arriving. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah. He's been uh, back. Uh, yes. Mm. <laughs> he left the building in Vegas. Right. <laughs> <laughs> left the building. Um, all right. Thanks, Joan. Um, I am going to talk for a few minutes about infrastructure because um, it's wonderful what uh, the ladies and their teams are working on. But at the end of the day, moving folks in and around the region and making sure they can get to some of these wonderful attractions is the key. Um, you've heard me speak uh, previously about our multimodal transportation program um, where we partner up with the T for shuttle service from uh, uh, both uh, Wellington and Malden Center. Um, uh, the new bus stops, we just completed the new bus stops on Broadway right in front of the property and um, we're already getting word that people have figured out that you can even get out at Sullivan Square and jump on a number of bus lines and your first stop when you, uh, when you leave Sullivan Station and head north on Broadway is right in front of us. So um, people have said that you know they get on the bus and they're there in five minutes. So it's really working well in terms of interconnecting with public transit. Of course, our neighborhood, neighborhood shuttle um, just started this week and we've already got ridership on that. Um, the premium park and ride will begin um, right at our opening and will be at, in Mulberry and Rock, um, Rockland Park and then up at Londonderry in New Hampshire. Can't wait to start that service. Um, the premium harbor shuttle service, um, we had one of our vessels out with the Coast Guard this week uh, doing its um, inspections. Um, 
minor list of things that they're working on, and then uh, the, the second and third boat will be out as well. Um, all of that will be timed with our planned opening, so those uh, vessels will be in service. Uh, we can't wait to show that off to the public. I think that's going to be a wonderful opportunity, um, and we're focusing on our three stops, one being, of course, Encore Boston Harbor, um, the other being Long Wharf North, and the third uh, being the World Trade Center out in the seaport. Um, you know, as part of our plan, we are joining the Transportation Management Associations of Better City uh, and, and the Transportation Management Association. Um, all of that with the idea of um, sharing best practices and understanding how we can do things better to move people around. It can involve carpooling and vanpooling and distributing materials and guaranteed ride home. Um, all of the things that um, help us make a, uh, our place truly mass transit oriented development, which has always been one of our goals. Um, Bob, creating infrastructure. Bob, if I yes. just interrupt, I don't know if this is a, a great time, and, and, and you can correct me if you'd like to address that later, but there have been questions around the parking for employees uh, this past week. Sure. And I, um, I think that it's probably fair to say that the commission itself is not really fully briefed. I don't know if you're in a position to brief us on sure. that issue. Sure. I'd be, I'd be happy to Is address it. Is this a good it. time? Yeah, it's, okay. it's perfectly fine because we're on infrastructure. Yeah. Um, uh, as you probably know, we made arrangements for parking um, at Wellington. Um, Wellington is actually a very important transportation hub for that for us. Um, and so we've got, we built and just recently opened a brand new um, shuttle location uh, within the MBTA's facility at Wellington. It gives us um, our own island um, that we share along with a couple other uh, local businesses that have shuttle service. At the same time, we made significant improvements um, in and around the station, paving and lighting and crosswalks uh, to make that a better place. So naturally, um, it's a wonderful spot to intercept both guests that are and employees that are riding on the orange line and those that want to park um, you've also heard previously uh, in our meetings that that uh, station landing area is where we're going to be putting our daycare center as well so the coordination of orange line plus daycare plus folks that have to park all made sense for us to consolidate a lot of that activity at wellington um, what you heard recently, I think, is there is a lot of confusion about what's going on. The parking garage in Wellington is um, subdivided. There is a um, large part of the garage that is just for anybody who decides to go. Um, but the MBTA also has a, um, in a sense, almost like a condominium with inside that uh, garage and floors five, six, and seven are um, a deal that was made some time ago where the T has a number of spots that they actually, I believe, are selling for, I think, $5 a day um, as part of their program. Um, the T also has a very substantial surface lot over at Wellington. And when the announcement came out recently, they actually went back to um, Joe Pesatoro, who's the T spokesman, and he made the comment that there are still um, daily and monthly parking passes still available. There's space within the surface lot, I know because some of our team members are currently using it. Um, and there's also, um, you know, we, we've obviously, we've lived and worked over by Station Landing for years, so we know that area fairly well. Um, the upper floors of the garage at Wellington are fairly lightly used, and so there is plenty of availability. Um, what happened was the uh, private company that runs the garage there changed their, um, some of their policies with regard to monthly passes. But I think the confusion was that folks believed that there was no parking left or that people would now not have an option and I believe the T cleared that up with their statement and so I do believe we're okay we will communicate back um, I know we've been in contact um, with the local community to make sure um, Jackie and I were just talking about that this morning so I do think there's some other communication work that needs to be done but I want to be very clear there is still parking available in those locations it may be that you buy it differently but the parking is available and available um, still through the T at a discounted rate. So I think we'll be okay. I do believe there was a, a communication issue. No, not at all. So it's a great, great timing because we're talking about infrastructure. 
Yes. Yes. Um, so my next um, my next topic is to talk about um, uh, people infrastructure because obviously without um, our wonderful team we would not be able to do what we do. Um, I want to thank Commissioner Stebbins for joining us this past uh, Saturday for the graduation of our first group of students um, from the uh, program that we have, uh, nicknamed uh, Bet On You, along with the Community College, um, its official name, of course, the Greater Boston Gaming Career Institute. But as you know, we shorten everything. Um, so <laughs> they, they, they like to call it Bet On You. We had, and I think, Commissioner, you would agree, the most enthusiastic graduation that I have been in attendance at for many, many years. This was a group of young men and women, professionals that are entering um, kind of a new chapter and career. Uh, and these students were so excited. Most of them began, not only did they graduate on Saturday, they had to show up for work on Monday for their first day of orientation. And they couldn't wait to start. Um, it's, t it's turned out that the program has worked even better than what we expected. As a matter of fact, we are still in the process of hiring dealers. Um, just to give you a general update, we have, as of Monday, 4,800 people now on the payroll the, uh, as of this past Monday. Um, we've got about 1,000 to go, and of that last 1,000, um, we've uh, put out offers for all but about 300. But within the 300 group, a large uh, group that we need still are dealers. So we are um, revving up next week another section of the, the dealer school program. And um, in consultation with Doug Williams, who runs our table games, in mid-July, we're going to start um, yet again another class at the dealer school. And we're going to focus that one on a uh, weekend opportunity. Because we do get a lot of people that are still currently employed, and they are interested in maybe switching a career but they can't do the dealer school if it can, uh, obviously if there's a conflict with their current paycheck. Um, so we're gonna open up a weekend session and we'll get, we're, I know that sounds surprising, but we get a lot of folks that are willing to work there, 40 hour work week, and then come in on a Saturday and Sunday and do the two days and get this intensive pr uh, training program done because they know that there's a good career um, out ahead of them. And for those that get involved early in the, uh, when we open, the opportunity for advancement actually comes quicker. So they're, they're a very smart bunch. They really know that if they can get in early and they can do a good job, when we have openings for supervisory roles, that gives them a leg up if they've been at, uh, been at the place early. So this has been a smash success. Cambridge College, amazing partner in all of this. Uh, and we thank both Jill. Jill's been active in this. Um, Jill was out there as well um, to see this on Saturday, uh, but it was really a, a great thing for us. And, uh, Mr. DeSalvio, didn't just about everyone get hired that went through the school? I Almost. mean, the, the numbers were really um, tremendous, Very, right? very high percentage. And um, the other thing that we did, we had a few people um, that struggled with the class but were wonderful potential team members. And so we encouraged them to look for other work, even within the, within the facility. And so, and then, yeah, there were a few that we did have some folks that didn't quite make it, um, but you're gonna get that. Um, it is pretty intense. Uh, I will tell you, I don't think I'd make it through the dealer school, to be honest <laughs> with you. Um, I, can, I can do a number of things. Quick math is probably not at the forefront of it. It's, it's a pretty intense program, and you have to be willing to, um, do it under pressure well, to and you think about a Saturday night and having to oh. actively work a game I know you've seen this I have and it's uh, it's definitely I would, I would not be for in me. the camp with you that I don't know how successful I'd be <laughs> but you must have tremendous instructors if so yeah. many of those folks were able to be yeah. um, to be successful and move on to careers. they the instructor team is amazing and here is what here is the real surprise uh, the programs were nine weeks and 14 weeks, but at the end of the program, um, our dealer school was packed after they were done. And what would happen is they would come back to the school almost daily on their own time, even though the class was over, to practice with each other. Mm -hmm. 
Now that tells you something about the passion for the they're workforce motivated. and they're how motivated they are mm -hmm. because there have been folks that have probably done the course the equivalent of twice mm -hmm. just through coming back over and over again to practice on their own. Wow. So it's been very impressive to see. Um, hospitality recruitment, um, obviously a big part of what we do. Um, you know, I've, I've spoken at the previous sessions, the, we did these massive job events over at the Heinz, but that was really um, only a part of the story. We've done smaller events by the hundreds and continue to do, do them. As I mentioned, we still have openings, so, um, you know, we're, we're telling folks to stay in touch. Um, we have the Career Center that's still open over at Station Landing and we'll continue to add more folks. Um, the NECAT program has been a, a, real, uh, a real positive for us in connecting with um, some folks for the ho uh, culinary hospitality training. We had some of the NECAT folks there on Monday who joined us for um, orientation on our very first day. So we were happy that worked out well. Um, and then there's other hospitality infrastructure and outreach with um, all of the um, schools and programs that are in the surrounding area that we'll maintain with, um, including the, um, the tech high schools, which have been a great part of what we do between now vocational schools, community colleges. Um, there are hospitality programs sort of growing in leaps and bounds all over the place, and we'll partner with all of them. And so with that, I want to... Um, either turn it back over to Jill, open it up for questions for any of us, and maybe even, do you want Martha? Martha, thank you so much. I know we uh, changed the time on you a couple okay. times today, no but thank you for coming over, and if you wouldn't mind saying a few words and introducing yourself sure. uh, to the commission. Good morning, I'm, I'm Martha Sheridan, I'm the, uh, it seems loud, <laughs> I'm the president and CEO of the Greater Boston Convention and Visitors Bureau. I am five months into the job, and, um, have had the privilege and pleasure of working for many, many years alongside Joan and Bob in our previous roles. So um, I know them well, and I know the caliber um, of uh, uh, resort that they will manage and sell. And um, I'm delighted to say that they have jumped in with both feet in uh, working with us to promote this great destination. And for us, that's particularly important um, you know, the tourism industry in Mass is somewhat under-resourced as when it comes to uh, promotional uh, investment from the state and uh, city level. So for us to have this incredible infusion of um, national and international promotion uh, by Encore on behalf of not just their property, but more importantly, this, the region and the state is, um, I, I can't even begin to tell you how valuable this will be to our efforts. I know um, Joan mentioned how uh, we are a unique proposition here now that Boston is, um, in our minds, one of the only major gateway cities in the country that has this caliber uh, resort casino adjacent to it. And I think that makes us uh, very, very uniquely positioned to draw new and unique visitors to the market. And I've been in this business for 30 years. I've um, worked very closely in Rhode Island with uh, the Twin River uh, Casino. I was on their advisory board and um, also worked closely with Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun. And um, uh, both, all three of those entities do a nice job of integrating into the community, but I'm not sure we've seen, I've seen it at this level. And it's been, J Joan has been part of our team, really our sales team for several years now. And it's been great for us to have that kind of added infusion of interest in our trade show booths. Um, she draws new people over to our booth, which only helps all of the small businesses that participate in our trade show. So from our perspective, um, we are very, very excited. And I know a lot of times when uh, resorts like this get built in communities, there is actually oftentimes a lot of pushback from the existing hospitality partners. And in fact, I was at a meeting yesterday where you know, the hoteliers that were in the room were talking about how they are actually looking forward to having Encore as part of our mix because they do think it will bring unique visitors to our community and expose those visitors to all of the other assets that they can take advantage of at future times. So I can't say enough about uh, what the partnership means to us. I met with Joan and uh, the head of uh, public relations from Wynn yesterday in planning for the media 
tour and um, the great partnership there. Uh, the fact that uh, they will be bringing in, we could never do this on our dime, uh, 200 uh, members of the uh, travel and trade press uh, into this market. Uh, we can't put a dollar amount on that. And the fact that they will support our efforts to bring them outside of their casino, which is not not the typical case in that world, um, is I, beyond what we can uh, put a figure on. So we're excited to continue this relationship and really look forward to the caliber of customer they'll bring to our community um, and the fact that many customers will come to Boston and actually stay in other hotels because they want to experience the casino for a half a day or a day. So I know we focus a lot on bringing customers in and staying in the casino itself, but I think sometimes we lose sight of the fact that now we will have people that will be interested in staying in the greater Boston area in other properties that want to take advantage of the casino um, and its amenities while also spending money in the city. So. Um, nothing but great things to say about this, the start of this partnership, and I've, I've had the, um, the privilege of seeing and working alongside them on many aspects of this plan, and my, um, my constructive input has been well taken and certainly included in the plan as it relates to how we'll work with their internal staff in educating them about all there is to do in the community, so I want to thank them for that, so thank you for having Thanks Thank very much, Martha, you. for your support all the way through. It's been a great partnership. Questions from Commissioner Stevens? Yeah, I would, I would just like to, to jump in. Uh, the plan looks phenomenal. Uh, I also got to credit Jill and Crystal because you had the obligation to get the plan reviewed. Martha was transitioning in. Director Oral were transitioning in. So you actually had predecessors and successors all looking at the plan and offering their kind of input. But, um, it was great to meet Martha and say, here, you're going to look at this and sign off. <laughs> um, but we appreciate your help. Um, you know, the transportation piece is, has always been interesting because we've always talked about how it gets people to your property. Uh, but it's exciting to see you're thinking about it as a way to get people off property. Right. Uh, it's not just picking up people at the, at, the, at the boat stops and bringing them to your property. It's thinking about using those resources to get people back into the city of Boston or the, the surrounding community. So I thought that was really unique. Um, the workforce piece, which we have contributed to through the community mitigation fund uh, oftentimes to uh, address the issue that Martha just raised about uh, folks moving, looking for a different career, vacating a current employer, and how do we help create a pipeline to, to backfill that. Um, I think it's important to remind people that's going to be ongoing. Mm -hmm. uh, there will be people that will quickly realize that maybe a casino business is not where they want to be. Mm -hmm. um, so people who thought, hey, I'm not going to be employed on June 23rd, I've missed my opportunity. They shouldn't think that way, and you right. highlighted the fact that you're still going to have some uh, gaming uh, classes going on. So I think that's really important. Uh, I do have to say we had a workforce meeting about two weeks ago or last week uh, that Jackie and Jenny attended. And to see the level of participation around the table from regional employment boards, the Mass Higher Work Career Centers, plus all of the communities, Boston, Chelsea, Somerville, all around the table, a lot of community-based organizations, all with a simple goal of providing, you know, folks they work with a, a chance to, to, to find a new career. That was exciting. Um, I, I also want to take a minute to, to single you out, Bob, because when we were doing our due diligence on when is a potential licensee, um, we called around, I called around to some of the CVBs in the area where you came from. Uh, without mentioning you by name and just say what's your relationship with uh, Bethlehem Sands and they said oh my god Bob DeSalvio was great he jumped on board he got the rest of the board and some of the hangers on to actually step up and contribute so kudos Thank to you, you. I, I, I was thinking about that story as I was reading through the plan um, lastly I just want to kind of get on a soapbox a little bit because you mentioned director oral and talking about a strategic plan I think it's important for everybody to remember that the two biggest development projects in Massachusetts, being Encore Boston Harbor and MGM, 
uh, are designed to bring people to Massachusetts. There would have been no requirement from a hotel if we were just asking them to open up a casino. But these two biggest private development construction projects are meant to bring people in. And by virtue of your presence and success, you're generating revenue for tourism. You're generating it for the Mass Marketing Partnership. You're generating it for the Gaming Economic Development Fund. And I hope we find some leadership around that to say, let's start to Martha's point about not enough resources. Let's put some money back into the immediate regions regions of where a casino is located so that we can continue to prime the revenue funds mm -hmm. for other parts of the state as well. So thank right. you. Come off my yeah. uh, Commissioner Stebbins, you mentioned the workforce folks in the meeting recently. And uh, I was reminded of the early days and I spoke to um, Attorney Crum and, and uh, Director Griffin about this. You know, there was some animosity. I don't think people believed that this would be a real opportunity for them. They had been told that in the past, possibly, and that things didn't work out. So I, you know, just from, I don't know, maybe five years ago, right, when there was real, um, those meetings were tense. And I, you attended many more than I did, but the few that I did have an opportunity to attend, it's like, wow, this group is, is, um, is just not believing this is a real opportunity. And to hear from the two of you, actually the three of you, that. Boy, has that, uh, has that changed, and people really do believe now that they have opportunities. Um, I think that's a tremendous story in itself. Yeah, I, if I could just add, um, that has a lot to do with Encore Boston Harbor and their relationship with the community groups. Um, in one instance recently, um, we heard of uh, a community coalition that said, you know, we'd really like you to take a second look at X number of candidates. And, and they did, um, and ended up hiring some of the individuals. I mean, it's mm -hmm. um, instances like that that um, I think have turned uh, folks around. So it's really have to, to um, attribute it to Bob and his team. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to mention a couple of things uh, that both commissioners already alluded to, but um, um, your your plan is really comprehensive, and it's really uh, good to to hear your presentation today in the context that you put it. Um, clearly, there's a theme that emerges, and that is one of partnerships that you already can corroborate, uh, Martha, and we have also seen in, in other instances before, uh, as you lay out here. I'm also reminded of. Um, the time that we awarded the license, I was um, most impressed about particular key, uh, particular points that you that you mentioned here. Uh, most of the economic development and tourism clearly came under your uh, uh, section, Commissioner Stevens. But there was a real nexus into the finance section that I um, analyzed uh, with the help of uh, our consultants, and that was the fact that significant revenues came from outside of the market area and the way that we analyzed this was by looking at the resources that you put or you promised to put um, to make those efforts happen. And, and I, I'm reminded of one key um, number, and that was the number of marketing professionals that you have worldwide that you spoke to earlier that are exclusively dedicated to bringing gamers around your properties and other, uh, other people uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, tourism. So um, I think that's a, a very important part of the overall uh, license here. And, I, and it's exciting that you are uh, making it happen and you are talking about it. And we really look forward to how all of that trans translates into what, uh, uh, what you had uh, all projected. Thanks, Commissioner Zim. Thank you, and we understand that there will be a vote for this in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you, everyone. Thank and, you. Um, thank you. Uh, just to Martha, Bob was gracious to suggest that he owned the change in timing. That was our decision, and we appreciate you being able to be nimble today. Um, I was trying to cover. You were covering, <laughs> but I, I accept that, but I did want to accept full responsibility, so thank you for accommodating us. No, not a problem, Joe. Joan was quick on the phone. Like, <laughs> he was able to get here in an unair condition.
<laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much, and and congratulations on your new position. Oh, thank you. Okay, we'll move on to uh, section seven B. Oh, I guess for the workforce, but it's Bob is staying, and Jackie, and Jackie. will move up, yeah. and we have Jenny Peterson, I believe, who might be joining us or Jenny, no? Just Jenny's, okay. Jenny's hiring people at the moment. That's excellent. We will go with that. So I have Bob and Jackie who will stay on for. Um, the design and construction commitments on uh, diversity. Thank you. Director Griffin. All right. Uh, Chairwoman, commissioners, um, back again. Um, and uh, the topic is diversity pre opening compliance. And um, I think, as all of you know, um, staff has been um, very busy and very diligent in uh, combing through the uh, myriad of commitments um, and license conditions uh, that are required prior to opening of uh, the casino. And um, I wanted to present to you today um, the commitments related to um, the construction, specifically the diversity in the workforce and the supplier diversity commitments um, during design and construction um, of the facility. Um, so, um, uh, no vote is expected today. Again, um, the vote will be uh, expected at the next meeting. Um, I wanted to go through um, briefly summary, uh, summarize some of those conditions that are in the memo, um, but the affirmative marketing program um, for design and construction. So the licensee, as you know, is um, required to submit a plan um, uh, that pertain to minority business enterprises, veteran business enterprises and women business enterprises for the design and construction of the uh, establishment. And it was required to include a robust public outreach component um, directed to those businesses. Um, you'll see attachments in, in the packet of some of the flyers and outreach um, that are not exhaustive, but an illustration of um, some of the um, outreach um, that Encore has done. Um, so they have satisfied that requirement. Additionally, the Affirmative Action Program for Equal Opportunity um, is the provision of a plan, including the public events and outreach for uh, individuals, minority individuals, women, and veterans. And um, Encore satisfied both of these requirements with a single diversity plan. Um, additionally, um, their um, diversity strategy for design and construction, in addition to providing that plan, they adhered to it very well and executed it well. Um, in that plan, um, they included um, their project goals um, for the utilization of minorities, women, and veterans on construction jobs, and also, likewise, the minority business enterprises, the WBEs and, and BBEs as well. Um, they um, followed the, the uh, requirements um, regarding reporting um, relative to these um, groups. Um, and attached in your packet is um, a recent um, report um, that they can speak to. Um, Additionally, I just wanted to call attention that um, um, we have uh, performed um, staff, including um, uh, uh, other staff, have um, complied with a diversity audit, where we um, went down to Encore. Um, we um, collected information on um, certain vendors, certain um, suppliers, um, and workforce um, records. We combed through those records. We were really looking for um, their uh, processes, um, what kind of um, system management systems they had in place, and 
we wanted to see if that, um, how accurate the data was that was presented at the Access and Opportunity Committee meetings. And we found that um, they had appropriate s systems for the collection, tracking, and management of this data. Um, and overall, um, you know, uh, we knew that they were on target with their diversity goals. Um, one of the things that we especially noted was their diligence um, um, and the transparency regarding their workforce goals. Um, their uh, corrective action meetings, their correspondence with the subcontractors, their use of the um, Uh, the turnstile um, to um, double check um, the accuracy of the data or um, for example if they noted that a, a subcontractor all of a sudden their um, uh, employees um, the tradespeople um, had decreased in a certain area um, they would contact that uh, subcontractor immediately um, so that was really noteworthy and something um, I wanted to call out. Um, so I wanted to stop at that point and see if you had any questions. Um, no vote is expected today. It's a, um, it's a high grade coming from you, Director Griffin. <laughs> Usually there's some constructive points where things could improve, but uh, you're, you, uh, and as, as I am as well, this is a, it's really impressive especially the real-time adjustments. You notice something's changed, why and how do we make an adjustment? That's, that's really impressive. Um, so I, I would point out that they um, met or exceeded all of the goals with the exception of the um, women business enterprise um, for design. Um, and as you know, much of their work was performed by the internal wind design team. Um, so um, that was understandable, but we definitely saw um, that the licensee gave best efforts. So the design team in Las Vegas has to be a little proactive like we are here? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so do you have anything to add? If no, do you want me to go through the yeah. okay. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I think it's always nice when the numbers actually reflect the effort that was put in, and I think we're very proud of what we were able to accomplish. A large part of that was, as, as you mentioned, uh, Commissioner Cameron, was staying on top of it on an almost daily basis and reaching out when we saw issues to correct them in real time. Uh, I know you're very familiar with our goals, and I'll touch on them as I go through the results. So this is as of the end of April. We are, of course, compiling the uh, the data for the end of May, and uh, we will present that uh, obviously at the next uh, occasion. But we haven't seen uh, any significant deviation in the results for May, just based on the data that we have to date. So, um, on the uh, design contracts, we awarded 13 contracts to minority business enterprises. We had a goal of 7.9% and we were actually awarded 8.4% for a total of $5.5 million worth of contracts. On the women business enterprises, we awarded 14 contracts. We had a goal of 10%, and this, as, uh, as Jill said, we, uh, we fell slightly short here at 8.2 for a total of 5.4. And I think it's actually noteworthy why, to look at why we fell short on this. As, um, as discussed, a large part of our design work is done through our internal design team. But I think also a lot of our design work had been contracted before we developed the plan and before we uh, were actually tracking, which is, I think, shows the benefit of having the plan in place early and actually tracking it in real time. On the veteran business enterprises, we had a goal of 1% and we exceeded that. Uh, we had 6.1% for $4 million worth of contracts and four total contracts. On the construction contracts, we awarded 
$262.7 million worth of contracts to minority women and veteran business enterprises. Uh, we had a goal overall of 11.4% and we exceeded that goal and hit 19.1%. Uh, we awarded 81 minority business enterprises contracts. Um, our goal was 5% and we were at 5.9% for a total of 80.6 million, 80 million contracts. Uh, on the women business enterprises, we awarded 152 contracts. Uh, our goal was 5.4% and we far exceeded that by 12.7% for a total of 174.8 million in could, contracts. Could I stop you there? I mean, those numbers are really impressive. Could you give an example of um, some of the kinds of contracts? There were 152 contracts Retail. with significant dollar amounts. Uh, so I'll flip to the next couple of pages. Uh, well, we don't uh, disclose the actual dollar amounts for confidentiality. No, reasons. I just mean the total. I was looking at oh. the total. Those are significant numbers. Those are significant. Yes. And, um, it, we were able to identify some excellent women business enterprises. I think what we were also uh, what we also realized was breaking the packages down into smaller packages allowed uh, companies that could not bid on an entire package as we would traditionally have been able to do so uh, gave them the opportunity to participate. A lot are local as well, mm -hmm. um, you can see. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, I think Jackie hit the nail on the head. It's trying to break up the packages mm -hmm. and having them um, uh, spread to as many businesses as possible mm -hmm. is a big help. Yeah, I guess I'm, well, the gravel business, the stone business, yeah, it stucco. Was across, it was across, it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't sort of soft trade, right. you, Michael. Correct. It was across the board. Right, yeah. Yeah. great, great work, thanks. Uh, so on the veteran business enterprises, we had a goal of 1% and we hit 2.8%. One of the um, areas that, that um, was somewhat more difficult in the veterans world is a lot of uh, veterans don't disclose that they are veterans. So, uh, and there, there wasn't an official uh, way to do it. So the Gaming Commission was incredibly useful to us in terms of getting some of these uh, companies registered as veteran-owned veteran businesses. So on the construction workforce, we had 5,661,677 hours of work performed by minorities, women, and veteran workers. Uh, that was a total of 7,354 workers that we had on site. Um, our goals were 15.3 uh, minority, and we achieved 25.3. For uh, female, it was 6.9% was our goal, and we hit 7.2%. Uh, that was not without significant effort. Uh, I think, as I've, alluded, uh, as I've spoken about before, what's even more important is the number of women that we were able to get into the pipeline that are not reflected on our jobs, but hopefully will be, in, uh, be able to work on other construction projects. And then on the veteran, we had a goal of 3%, and we hit 5.4%. So if you have any questions for us. Um, each of you come from other properties, re other companies. Have you ever been required to um, really pay attention to this extent to, um, to hiring uh, minority female and veterans? Uh, it's, it's always been something that's been talked about. I don't think it's ever been tracked, at least in my experience, to this extent. And I don't, I've never seen the kind of effort that went into it that we put into it. And I mean, Commissioner, I'll add that we had the, we had goals in Pennsylvania's, in Pennsylvania when I did the project there, but the tracking mechanisms have gotten much more sophisticated. For example, the, the turnstile program where literally everyone has to go through the safety trailer, um, get, a, get training, get their badge, mm -hmm. and we're able to then issue a badge that can then be tracked and monitored on the site. Um, which was wonderful from a lot of perspectives, but between that and um, really the internal work that was done. Um, and and a, a shout out to, to John Fish mm -hmm. and everybody at Suffolk. Um, they work day in and day out with the subs to really push this. Um, and I think the other uh, major turning point for us was the um, rewards program and recognition. 
the fact that we had quarterly awards and uh, you know prizes, trips to Las Vegas, um, gift certificates. Um, there's nothing better than having a scorecard, mm -hmm. and it works. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Do mm -hmm. sure. Director Griffin, and in the course of this very successful outcome, were you able to identify any barriers that continue to persist, perhaps with the smaller um, vendors or contractors? I know, with respect to design, women are actually doing quite well in Massachusetts. Um, I'm sure they would have loved to have participated, but we understand that you used your own, your own in-house resources. But it, were there other barriers that you saw with respect to either you know, capital? Uh, um, yes, I, I think, um, so there were an, an, hmm. Cause the outcomes here are excellent, so I don't want to put you on the spot, but I just wondered, in the, because you're so experienced in this area, is there still a place where in Massachusetts we can continue to support MBEs, WBEs, BBEs in a way that helps them gain capacity to enter? So, so one of the things, um, this is a union construction project, mm -hmm. and um, so the firms needed to um, be union signatory. So that was a limiting factor in some ways um, if a firm decided not to uh, participate. Um, so that would be um, one area, you know, during construction. Um, and I think just the size maybe of the business, not everyone had the capacity. Um, so I think generally um, the same constraints that you might see for other construct large construction projects. And then on a second question I have, I think I understand correctly that the practices that you've employed here um, might be being adopted on other projects here in Boston and, or, and in Massachusetts generally. So I don't know if, if you can speak to that or not. Um, I could talk about um one in particular that Jackie mentioned earlier, and that is the uh, formation of the Girls in Trades group, mm -hmm. which really has spread to be now more statewide. Um, they've had a meeting out in Western Mass. Um, I know that Marianne Hamm, who w uh, partnered with Jenny Peterson, is um, over out at uh, Minuteman uh, uh, Technical School, and they're going to focus a lot on this. And I think this has a lot of legs and that will be something that uh, the pipeline will continue to grow in the future and I would say one of the long-lasting um, impacts of this will be the recognition of the incredible work that women do on the job site. And that's a program that has been adopted in Western Massachusetts yeah. as well. So it's, yeah. That's very exciting. I think this is also a statistic that the uh, construction companies are embracing. So this is a selling point for them, and the more that they can do this with other jobs, the, the more they can increase this. This is something that they're proud of too, and uh, they're starting to implement on other jobs as well, we've seen. I think one of the things I also would love for you to talk about is equal access once you're on the site in terms of the work hours, mm -hmm. because you were describing sort of a dip and a frustration that you had, and you dove deeper into the numbers to find out why working hours for some of the right. women were dropping. And I think that's a sort of a deeper probe into not only getting them in the trades, but getting them equal access when they're on site. Mm -hmm. right. It'd be helpful, I think, if you could describe that. Mm -hmm. Either one. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, so uh, I, I think we described this previously at another meeting, but uh, what happened was we saw as the subcontractors were winding up some of their work, what was happening was the numbers were dropping. And what they were doing was letting the, the senior people on their teams stay on the job and getting rid of some of the more junior people on the team. Uh, of course, given given uh, sort of how unions have have uh, been for a long rules. time, mm -hmm. um, that meant that a lot of the women that were newly joined to the union were getting laid off before the uh, before other people. So once we were able to identify that problem, it was. A very simple fix. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the other um, things that um, Jenny delved into was um, overtime hours right. and the availability of mm -hmm. overtime for all um, individuals. Right. And so, and that was something that I think the 
turnstile and some of your other systems um, were helpful yeah. in determining it? Uh, all throughout the construction project, we received every single, twice a day, we would get a list of every single uh, subcontractor on the site, uh, you know, how many workers they had on the site, and it, it was in real time. We were getting it as they checked in in the morning and as the second shift happened. So we could track these numbers really, really closely, and I think that was a huge benefit. I should add one that uh, maybe Director Griffin is being a little modest about, because um, the Access and Opportunity Committee here, I think, was a key, uh, a key factor uh, in, in bringing all the stakeholders together so everybody, everybody has a share, and that was also alluded to. Uh, but but ch you know, chairing that committee, um, convening it, uh, keeping it on track, um, and keeping everybody engaged uh, was, was a key success factor, in my, in my opinion, and you should, you should, you should be recognized for that. Commissioner, thank you. I, I wanted to note that Encore Boston Harbor attended 45 Access and Opportunity Committee meetings since um, March of 2015. And these were monthly meetings that um, I think these may have been the meetings that you were alluding to, um, Commissioner Cameron. Um, they started off um, uh, a little feisty, let's just say. Um, and and people weren't trusting one another and um, in the end um, at a recent meeting community groups that had um, or individuals representing the community who had originally I think battled um, were commending Encore uh, for sticking with it um, and for um, and, and I actually had to commend um, Jenny Peterson on your team um, she has a remarkable ability um, when uh, suggestions are presented, even in um, ways that um, maybe are a little hostile. Um, <laughs> she has an ability to see through that and at the next meeting re implement and report out. And um, she did a remarkable job in, in really gaining the trust of the I think that was key, was getting the trust of those uh, individuals. I think a lot of them had experienced other projects where they, they had the same sort of access and nothing happened. So I think they were very pleased to see that Jenny was taking all of their suggestions. And, you know, frankly, you have to have buy-in from the very top on this, and, and Bob's been yes. an immense help on you do. that. And so he gave her all the support, and I think that, that really drove the numbers. Mm -hmm. I also want to mention just uh, one more thing that you only mentioned briefly, Director Griffin, and that is uh, the compliance audit. Our comfort level with the numbers that have been reported all throughout and, and today is very high based on the, the work that you and Joe Delaney have done. Um, this was uh, priorly, uh, previously discussed at a compliance group that uh, 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 Director uh, Bedrosian uh, chairs in more detail. But I happen to be a, be a, a, a member, and um, it was—it's uh, an important um, process for us to perform and get comfortable with. And uh, and, and, and your audit has been a, a really good um, effort in that, in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Great work. Thank you. Really good work. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and and that will be a vote again for the future. Correct. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. And thanks uh, for all the work that's going on right now. We appreciate Thank you. it. Could we take a quick break? Now? We may. Um, um, Commissioner Enrique has requested a break. I'm sure my fellow commissioners would enjoy it as well. And for our Plain Ridge folks, um, good morning. We understand it was a little bit of a challenge in, in, uh, to get here, and we're happy to see you. Do you mind if we just uh, try your patience a little bit longer and uh, we'll take a quick break. We'll return in 10 minutes to um, oh, it'll be, uh, just short of noon. Thank you. So we are reconvening our meeting.
And we are now shifting again on our agenda to original number five for um, Plain Ridge Park Casino's quarterly report, Ombudsman Ziemba, please. And good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, thank you. Is it I still? Yeah, five minutes. Yeah, it's, still, yep. it's still before noon, so thank you. Well, good morning, Chair and Commissioners. <laughs> So on the Commission's agenda today, there are several matters pertaining to Plain Ridge Park, uh, including Plain Ridge Park's quarterly report for the first quarter of 2019, and then separately under Director Griffin's report, uh, the Commission is also scheduled to vote on Plain Ridge Park's amended uh, workforce plan. Uh, so at the end of the quarterly report, I'll ask Director Griffin to come take uh, the seat here. Uh, and we can get those matters done if, if that is okay with the Commission. That's a good plan. Thank you. Okay. Um, as the Commission uh, recalls, uh, both um, the workforce plan uh, and a more comprehensive review of Plain Ridge Park's um, compliance with all their commitments um, uh, was part of the February 28th uh, Commission meeting, and we went into depth about a number of different matters. Uh, they'll be addressed both in the workforce plan and also in the quarterly report. So up first, uh, we're, we're going to ask Plain Ridge Park to present its quarterly report uh, for the first quarter of this year. And Representative Plain Ridge Park are Lance George, General Manager, Mike Miller, Vice President of Operations, um, Michelle Collins, Vice President of Marketing. Uh, Lisa McKenney is also here to answer any questions you may have. Uh, but we're also joined by two uh, new members uh, from Plain Ridge Park. And I'm going to turn it over to Lance, and he will also introduce our new members. Thanks. Yes, also with us uh, behind me is Dana Fortney, who is our Vice President of Finance. I think she's been with us for three months. Three months, relatively new. And then next to her, we also have Kathy Lucas, who is our new Vice President of Human Resources. She's been with us for three days. Oh, so. oh wow. Okay. Well, well, thank you. So with that introduction, we'll jump right into it. Get the report up. Okay. Touch on revenue and taxes paid. Uh, several numbers on this slide. I'll call your attention to just a few. A year-over-year -year comparison of the first quarter shows a modest decline in revenue and taxes paid. This decrease was driven largely by the opening of Tiverton Casino in Rhode Island which opened in September of 2018 would not have impacted last year's Q1 numbers. Softer months in January and February with a more encouraging March. Unpredictable weather in, uh, in New England in Q1 also plays a bit of a role for us. It's a bit of a wild card. All in for the first quarter of 2019, the combination of taxes paid to the Commonwealth and fees paid to the horsemen at 49% totaled just over 20 million with gaming revenues just under 41 million. Uh, successful start to, uh, to 2019 for us. Uh, lottery sales, again, several numbers. Highlight just a couple of them. Q1 2019, total sales of 868,000, a slight decrease of approximately 3%, which is commensurate with the decrease in gaming revenues. Encouraging beginning of the year for us, no material change to the relationship or in the approach. Uh, in essence, same number of games or PALs, I believe they call them at the lottery, same locations, Kino's in the same location. So we continue to generate significant revenue for, uh, for the lottery. It's been a great story for us from the beginning. Mr. George, I was recently asked that question in a public hearing about why do we think that Plain Ridge has been so successful in this partnership. Um, if I remember correctly, and I know you will correct me if I'm wrong. Sure. It, it's generated like a 25% increase in lottery sales in the the um, host area. Accurate, it, in that area. In that area. Yes. So do you have an explanation or the strategy? Or could you guess? <laughs> no. I, no, I, I, I'd love to think we were really, really smart, uh, placed them in the right location. Certainly we worked with the lottery in advance of opening on where these should go, the number of them, the locations. Um, but I, I don't know that I can pinpoint exactly why it's been so successful for us. Um, would uh, Director Sweeney actually say that they are driven through the PAT machines in the casino, or is he also pointing to uh, um, the convenience retail uh, agents that have also seen increased sales? Do you know that? 
I, uh, as to where those specific increases, is it driven yeah. more out of retail or the machines? Well, um, uh, from convenience stores and retail agents that are outside of the casino, are they also seeing increased foot traffic because of visitation, or is it strictly the increase coming from the PATs at your location? Good question. I don't know oh, the okay. performance of stores that surround us. Yeah, well, I just wondered because we did um, we did have information about that. We did. They were they remained pretty steady, which was a good news story because they were worried that they would uh, decrease. Yeah. Yeah. But the drive really comes from within. Now you do a lot of promotions as well sure. with lottery products. Sure, there are times when when these sales are increased or inflated, if you will, because we have a relationship or we'll have a promotion for lottery ticket giveaways. Yes. Certainly when those jackpots get to a very staggering number, we'll offer those. It's proven very successful for us in the past. Right. But even if you back those numbers out, certainly it's something we're quite proud of. Right. So the cross-marketing promotions are really working. That was my next question. Yep. So. It, they, they are. I'm reminded of, and, and this, this is what you may be remembering, uh, Commissioner, um, of a uh, report from our Sigma team uh, that did an analysis of the lottery sales at Plain Ridge. And um, even though it's uh, a few months ago, uh, I suspect that the, um, the dynamics remain the same, especially because of the numbers. And, uh, and that is that you simply get a lot more gamblers at PPC and they uh, complement and buy also a lottery ticket. And uh, overall in the region, uh, Plain Ridge is what explains a lot of this um, stabilization or, or slight increase in, in, in overall uh, lottery sales. Um, and there's some dips in some of the uh, surrounding communities. Um, but, but I think it's, it's, uh, it's a good report very to go back well, to if we want to. Very uh, yeah. yeah, very but small. This is a success story. Yes. And I know that um, MGM folks are hoping to try to follow your lead. So I ask because, of course, it is a um, significant mandate in our statute. So thank you for that. And I understand it's a very small difference, right, for this report today. Correct. So Correct. thank you. Thank you. Great efforts. Uh, transitioning to spending and procurement by state. Next two slides will go hand in hand relating to in-state spending. Uh, for Q1 2019, 44% or approximately 600,000 of the eligible spend occurred in-state. The remainder is split amongst several other states. The decrease to the in-state spend percentage is driven in part by a change to one of our primary food vendors. Penn National as a company and as an organization nationwide is transitioning from Cisco to U.S. Foods. So you will see those dollars in the New Hampshire spend, which I believe is 200, 200 and change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 276,000. So 90. 95 plus percent of that is all food related and all driven by the transition from Cisco to U.S. Foods. Local spend, digging a bit deeper into the property's procurement for 2019, provided a breakdown of local spending. Approximately 61,000 of PPC's Q1 spend occurred in our local and surrounding communities with the dollar spread between all of the communities. Both the in-state numbers and local numbers move materially based on the timing of our capital projects for the year. So if you noticed a significant dip from Q4 to Q1 of this year, I think it was about 800,000. That's driven by some of the capital projects that were undertaken in Q4, most notably the change out of Be Good to Smashburger. Um, spent about 100,000 in the banquet space upstairs, IT related. So oftentimes we do not get to our capital projects until Q4. Um, but you will see that in Q2. So you will see significant spikes sometimes, and that's why. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. Vendor diversity as compared to our goals for, uh, for Q1 and co as compared to 2018 overall, as represented by the first set of bars, 29.5% of our spend occurred with either an MBE, WBE, or BBE. To the right of this is the detail behind that total, which shows a nice increase in the WBE category. This is largely driven by a few in-state WBE vendors, notably Ipswich Shellfish, Mill Hench Industrial Supply, and Kitteridge Food Service Equipment. Good find by Eli and the procurement team. Mm -hmm. Targets were achieved for both MBE and VBE as well, with a modest decrease and increase, respectively. 
you guys have been pretty strong, pretty <coughs> consistent on your vendor diversity, and it's interesting to see that you maintain those numbers despite not some of it under the locals been being attached to some of your capital projects. So these are operational supplies that continue to be focused on finding some uh, some good partners. Agree. And you've worked with Eli in the past. He's certainly focused on this. He understands the significance. Thank you. Mike? All right. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Commissioners. I'd like to share with you our Q1 employment numbers now. Uh, in Q1 of 2019, we had 461 employees. 315 of those were full-time employees, and that made up 68% of our staff. We had 142 part-time employees that made up 31% of our staff. Um, this is also when we start uh, hiring in our seasonal employees. Uh, so we have four seasonal employees. Uh, currently more now, we're up to 12, um, but as of Q1 when we brought them on, uh, we had four. These Are numbers, those racing individuals? These numbers uh, compare very favorably to both our prior quarter and the uh, same period Q1 of last year. Looking at our total employee base, our diversity hires made up 27% of the workforce. The veteran hires were 5%. Massachusetts-based employees made up 63% of the workforce, while our locally-based employees were 32%. In addition, our current uh, male-to-female mix remains at 50%, 50%. Can I ask a quick question there? Um, I know that um, You've implemented the Women Leading at Penn program, very impressive program. Um, has it helped with um, uh, getting women to, A, apply for promotion, receive promotion, move up, uh, move up into some of the management positions? It has. Uh, we had 15 girls that were active in the program, and of that, six of them have been promoted. Okay. Into Terrific. yeah advanced positions. And I see your interview. Uh, you're introducing new team members who who are at high level positions. So yes, we welcome that as well. Yes, we we want to note that the exec team is now 60 percent women. <laughs> wow. <laughs> hmm. That's the five of us here. <laughs> here it is exactly. Yeah. What a difference a year makes. <laughs> Thank you. Be Great report. Before you leave that slide, remind me the local definition in this slide. I'm sorry. Local. Uh, right now, local is 30, 32%. Yeah, but is that uh, the host and surrounding communities? Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. Going on to the compliance side, uh, during Q1, our security department checked 20,460 IDs at our podiums, and those ID checks prevented 429 individuals from entering the facility. Of those 429, nine were minors that were turned away, uh, as well as 79 underage individuals. There were also 341 that made up the difference that had either expired, invalid, or no IDs. Also during Q1, there were no fake IDs presented at any of our programs. Finally, uh, during the first quarter of this year, there were no minors or underage individuals found in the gaming areas gambling within the facility or found consuming any alcohol. So we do want to note and appreciate the continued diligence that our security team uh, does as well as all of our employees in preventing the underage gambling in the facility. Great. That's really a good report. Good Usually yes. there's a one or two in there somewhere and um, the team is doing a great job with that. Very proud of uh, yeah. that section. Yep. And with that being done, I'm going to hand it over to Michelle. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair and Commissioners. Good afternoon. We are going to look at the woman leading at Penn. Um, we, we just gave you some of the highlights, but for May, we had Ginny Shanks as our guest speaker. She's uh, the former EVP and Chief Administrator Officer for Pinnacle, and now she's currently working as a strategic advisor for the Penn properties. Uh, during her time, she gave lessons on what she's learned in the casino industry um, while she's been in the business. July, we're going to look at work-life balance, which I think we're all looking forward to. And then, as I mentioned earlier, what's important is that we actually track the program. It's very easy to implement a program. It's not easy to get results and actually measure the results. So we're excited to say that, as I mentioned, six of the 15 that were active participants have taken on a new role, either from an hour hourly to a salary management role, to a bigger property, to a regional role. So we're very excited about that development. 
and for those six that are no longer part of the program at the property, we've just uh, brought in six more from other various departments so that they can participate in the program. Terrific. Good results. And what's nice about that is the results are consistent across the Penn Enterprise, so other properties are also seeing the, the same kind of results. Uh, for local community, again, um, you know, typical to what we normally do each quarter where we work with uh, various programs. So the two to highlight here is we had our second annual, um, oh, sorry. We had our second annual comedy event for um, New Hope, which is an important um, message. It's, it provides comprehensive domestic violence and sexual assault services to the local area. In addition to that was the Polar Plunge, which uh, both Lance and uh, Steve O'Toole participated in, where they had to take a deep dive into a very cold lake um, and it, it raised awareness for the Mass Lions eye research. That's great. What, what month was this? That was in early April. Early April, and it was really cold? Yes, it was really cold. Uh, yeah, first time. Yeah. Great. Maybe last time. Maybe. <laughs> early April, really? <laughs> it was cold. That's the opening of summer almost in New England. Come on. Yeah. Not, not tough enough. <laughs> <laughs> Good work. We'll move into Q1 sponsorships. So we maintained our, our sponsorships that we've been doing for quite some time. That includes the Rentham Outlets. We've added TPC, the golf course, so that we can offer that amenity to our players. Uh, NBC Sports Celtics, we renewed the Fenway Concert Series, which we're excited about because it will allow us to bring our customers to a suite at each of the concerts. And then as we were talking earlier about the lottery, we recently did a promotion with them for March 23rd, when the jackpot was $685 million, we uh, purchased 500 tickets and gave them to the first 500 guests that came into the casino. So it generated excitement. It was a partnership, and, and we could really help raise awareness of how exciting the uh, jackpot was. And finally, for the Bruins, uh, this is kind of exciting. It's something different that we haven't done before and haven't been able to do before. But given where uh, two of our properties have played against the Bruins, we were able to send our customers there and they're sending their customers here. So tonight we have a group from our St. Louis property that will actually be at TD Garden watching the game. Wow, go Bruins. Oh, yeah. Great. <laughs> yeah, That's not what they're saying, but yes. I understand. <laughs> and finally and, for- And we do welcome them here. Yes, Very exactly. happy to Everybody's have welcome. them here. Yes. Uh, and for marketing highlights, uh, a couple of fun things that we did. We did a golden ticket, which was like a Willy Wonka chocolate bar, where there was uh, various free slot play prizes in the, on the golden ticket. We also did a, a pie day giveaway for 314, which uh, we worked with a local company uh, called the Ever So Humble Pie Company out of Walpole. And we purchased 1,500 mini pies and gave those out to our customers on 3.14 get it. Yep. <laughs> um, we also have the My Choice launch, which is coming up, and we're excited about this. This is our new loyalty program, and it's when we integrated Penn and Pinnacle Properties, we kind of combined the best of the best with the loyalty program. So some of the new initiatives that we'll be doing allows for us to offer more local amenities on our, our websites where they can use their points they're earning to actually purchase things that are around our area, which will include concert tickets, Red Sox tickets, uh, Southwick Zoo tickets, Luciano's gift cards, really what's in our local market and what's important to those that live in Massachusetts or those that want to visit Massachusetts. We partnered with uh, Responsible Gambling Month with GameSense, and then as always, we continue doing our comedy shows in the loft. Uh, the, the next thing we're excited to test out is this summer we'll be doing outdoor concerts at the Racing Apron. Terrific. Wow. So that's everything I have. Any questions? No, thank you. That's busy. You're welcome. Michelle, thank you. Sure. Very exciting. Thank so you. no further questions on the entire report? Good right. report. Uh, so commissioners, one, one final thing that I will mention is that I can attest that the Plain Ridge Park uh, crew has have been making uh, great efforts to uh, resolve the issue regarding the Section 61 finding involving Gatcher. I know that there's been numerous contacts uh, has not been resolved to date, but uh, it's still uh, a work in progress. And general manager and I just have just had conversations about that in the last couple of days. 
with that, let me turn it over to Jill. Thank you. And that Thank is you. actually 7C on our early agenda, just so folks can follow. Thank you. Great report. This will be Thank the Plain Ridge Park you. Casino Workforce Development um, Plan, which is up for a vote today. Thank you. Yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> so um, today we're here, and, and um, uh, I'm hoping you'll vote on the Plain Ridge Park Casino amended workforce development plan. And just by way of background, at the request of um, commission staff, Plain Ridge has amended their workforce diversity plan, which was originally submitted to the commission back in August of 2014 in preparation for their June 2015 opening. Um, as you can imagine, a lot has changed since then. Um, but uh, I wanted to add that commission staff and Plain Ridge Park representatives have had numerous conversations relative to both um, Plain Ridge Park's efforts to um, achieve the goals of their original plan um, and regarding the revised goals in the new plan. Um, Plain Ridge updated the workforce development plan, um, taking into account the um, lower unemployment rates, um, the more competitive gaming market, the neighboring economy of Rhode Island, and the recent changes to the Massachusetts minimum wage which will increase the minimum wage over the next five years in Massachusetts. Um, and uh, Plain Ridge has had multiple meetings um, with staff in order to refine their proposed new goals. Um, additionally, um, Plain Ridge Park's former Vice President of Human Resources, Ms. Kim, Kim Rigo, um, and I reviewed the plan with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Director of Career Services. Um, and these conversations all also helped to inform the revisions. Um, so um, you'll remember that this plan was originally presented to the commission back in February on the 28th, um, as John mentioned earlier, during a review of their progress in meeting other goals and requirements. Um, the commission requested that um, Plain Ridge Park discuss with its host and surrounding communities the status of its um, compliance with its goals and, and these new proposed plans. So um, Lance um, is prepared to discuss that today. The commission also suggested that the amended workforce plan be posted for public comment um, before taking any action on the plan. And, um, um, we did post the plan for public comment on March 6th until March 27th of 2019, and we received no comments on the plan. Um, so um, also included in your memo are um, the new hiring goals, um, one that 50% of Plain Ridge Park's workforce will be women, um, and this is formalizing something that they had um, been working towards. And at least 2% of Plain Ridge Park's workforce will be veterans. Previously, they had a hiring preference. And to hire 65% of Plain Ridge Park's workforce from Massachusetts, and that's a brand new goal. Um, and that's, that's a really impressive goal. I think that's really, I know how close you are to Rhode Island, um, your facility, but I, I do think valuing those folks that are from Massachusetts is important. I think based on what we've seen, that will likely be the most challenging to uh, to achieve based on the numbers that continue to come in. Uh, with that being said, I think the number I just saw was 62 or 63 percent, mm -hmm. so we're certainly in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and um, uh, Plain Ridge Park Casino has proposed revising certain hiring goals to hire 35% of Plain Ridge Park's workforce from their host and designated surrounding communities. And uh, as you know, this is revised from the 90%, which has um, not yet been achieved. 
um, their local hiring has hovered uh, consistently in the mid 30 percentage points um, with a low of 20 percent in quarter two of 2016. And as you know, the unemployment rate in their host and surrounding communities is, is actually quite low. Um, so, um, and, and another uh, revised goal that 15% of their workforce be comprised of individuals with ethnic mi from ethnic minority groups. And that this is an increase from their previous goal of, of 10%. So, um, so with that, um, I'm going to pause, and see if um, you have any questions, and then um, turn it over to Lance to talk about his discussions with the host and surrounding communities. Yeah, I, I'd like to actually hear that first, because that's, you know, when you talk about having a goal for hiring locally, it, does impact host and surrounding communities. You know, I'd, I'd be interested to hear kind of what their feedback was. Um, you know, as Jill provided, the unemployment rates are pretty low. If you wanted to hit that 90% goal, you would have to tell people, leave your job and come work for us, which could be an appealing pitch, but I, I'm curious to how the host and surrounding communities reacted to the plan's change. Uh, very briefly. Um, so we sent out an email, got responses from two communities. The communities that we didn't receive uh, emails from, we followed up with phone calls to ensure that they had received, reviewed it, and, and read it. Um, no concerns. No concerns. They thanked us for continuing to be a good neighbor. Um, they're very supportive of us. They've, they've always been very supportive of us, which is greatly appreciated. Um, but largely uh, uneventful. And so in, in the grand scheme, I think that's a good thing. But no, they did not express any reservations, any concerns, and, uh, and they thanked us for the information and for continuing to be a good neighbor. Uh, wasn't that 90% uh, left over from s the Springfield application? So it was really never achievable. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Yeah. So this is a more realistic goal. Yep. As well as you've increased your, um, your commitment to women, to minorities, and to Massachusetts residents. Agree, and it's it's not a layup either. I, I think Jill mentioned the lowest we've been is 20 percent. This goal has us at 35 percent. Mm -hmm. I think I just saw 32 percent come in. So we're going to have to stretch a little bit to get there. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that uh, that number that you mentioned was the subject of a lot of those discussions that you talked about, uh, Director Griffin, mm -hmm. including uh, that started uh, with the midterm. Um, license uh, review that also Ombudsman Siemba was, was part of. So there was a lot of analysis done uh, relative to uh, the efforts that they undertake, the realities of the marketplace, and, uh, and, and, and geography, as well as the unemployment rate. So I think all of that bears into uh, here to mention, yeah. which, I, which I'm comfortable with. Yeah, and, and one thing I didn't mention, um, some of those conversations was with our internal compliance committee yes. that um, yep. Commissioner Zuniga is a, Commissioner O'Brien. One thing I did want to add is that um, along with the um, um, revised goals, Plain Ridge Park <coughs> Casino has outlined specific tactics to help them um, meet those goals, including uh, hosting an annual on-site career fair, um, attending a minimum of one veteran career fair per year in Massachusetts, um, attending at least two college career fairs per calendar year in Massachusetts, and partnering with the Massachusetts Career Centers um, and coordinating um, hiring events. So um, there are clear commitments to their new Massachusetts goal and um, and to meeting the other goals. So I commend Lance as his, and his team. <laughs> I, I, I think this, I, I think a correction was certainly needed. I, I think we all understand that. Um, I, I do think, and, and John briefly talked about, you know, Gatcher issues, transportation issues are a challenge in the region because you could hit some communities that you know, do have higher pockets of unemployment who could find a career with, with Plain Ridge Park. It's just a question, how did they get there? Because there aren't the, the public transportation uh, resources available to them. 
Um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with this change. Uh, I, I would just kind of put out two questions. One is on the ethnic, ethnic minority group goal. Um, you know, this quarter you hit 27%. We're talking about moving your goal up to 15%. Um, I think that's fine, but I think as we kind of move forward, we look at you know maybe moving that goal up a little bit further, uh, or at least have some consideration around that. Um, and also, you know, we've stressed this. Uh, I think with our licensees is that you know we hope these goals are floors and not ceilings. Uh, you know, we certainly know you're doing everything you can, and that's why Jill's our watchdog on this. But um, setting these as floors and hoping that each time you know you kind of work to surpass those I, I know that's what you want to do and, you know if you can reassure us that that's your focus that would give us some confidence that's our focus okay. yeah. <laughs> Are there any further questions or discussion on this matter I believe that Ms. Griffin is, has made a recommendation uh, and of her report. Do we uh, have a motion? Yeah, Madam Chair, I'd move that the commission approve the amended Plain Ridge Park Casino strategic plan to engage and recruit the diverse under and underemployed workforce population in the new hiring goals and strategies within. Second. Any further discussion? I just would um, want to again commend you for the efforts and I do think it's a reasonable amendment. For those of you um, who have no further discussions, those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Catherine five zero, please. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you and have a good trip back. Now we will go. Actually, um, I'm not sure if any of our folks from Plain Ridge are staying for racing, but our next item would be our originally scheduled Steve, item Steve. number six. Yeah. Yeah, Steve. Yeah, Steve. Racing. Stick around for Dr. Steve. Dr. Light Brown. Back. Dr. Light Brown, always a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Give me one moment to just get my notes in order here. Please. I thought you were also part of the executive team. They didn't mention you. That's right. <laughs> one moment, please. Sorry. Dr. Lightbound, thank you. I almost needed a break just to get my notes together here. Thank you. Good afternoon. Please proceed. Thank you. Our first item on the uh, agenda for racing is the quarterly local aid payments, and I'm going to turn it over to Chad Bork, our senior financial analyst, to discuss that. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, so the first item we have is the quarterly local aid payment. Each quarter, in accordance with Section 18D of Chapter 58, local aid is payable to each city and town where racing activities are conducted. The amounts are calculated at 0.35% times the handle from the quarter ending six months prior to payment. So with that said, the local aid payment for the quarter ending June 30th, 2019 is in the amount of $181,638.36. Uh, this amount does reflect the total handle from racing that took place in October, November, and December of 2018. And on the second page, you'll see a breakdown um, of those handles, as well as the distributions um, that are payable to each city and town. Uh, this item does require a vote. 
Any questions for Mr. Bork? Your reports are always very thorough. Thank you. So I move I move that the commission approve uh, the quarterly aid payments for uh, quarter the second quarter in the amount of one hundred eighty one thousand six hundred thirty eight um, and thirty six cents as outlined in the memo. Second. Second. Second, the Commissioner Zuniga, please. And all further questions, all set. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Five zero, please. Okay. Moving on now to item six B. So, Plainage um, Park Casino has um, a two other uh, racing officials to add to their approval. With me is uh, Steve O'Toole, Director of Racing for Plain Ridge. Uh, the Commission delegated the uh, Director of Racing the authority to approve racing officials uh, if it was needed for um, business activities um, between meetings and that type of thing. So uh, these uh, two people have already been working. They've already um, passed the background checks of the state police and um, been signed off by the judges. And so today we need your approval. And if you have any questions, Steve's here to answer. Are these uh, employees replacing others, or um, are they just you needed additional staff? No, the um, <clears throat> the outrider has been with us uh, for a couple of years now, um, and the uh, it's a replacement for the photo finish and time position. Uh, Madam Chair, I move the commission approve the request of Plain Ridge Park Casino to approve Thomas Ryan, a Marshall Outrider, and Kelly Capico, timing and photo finishes racing officials. Second. Any questions for Director O'Toole? Thank you for coming today. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Five zero. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Item 6C. Next item is um, Suffolk Downs uh, request for capital improvements. And we have Vice President of Marketing Jessica Pichette here representing Suffolk. If you have any questions, and I'll turn it over to uh, Chad Bork again for this one. So, this is a request for reimbursement for um, Suffolk Downs <coughs> Capital Improvement Trust Fund. This is in the amount of $108,963.63. The commission approved the preceding request for consideration for all projects on March 28th. I have included copies of the request forms and opinion letters from Dixon Salo Architects. I did review all the supporting documentation including pictures of the completed projects, vendor invoices, copies of checks made payable to those vendors um, to ensure that the amount requested is, does match up with the amounts billed, which they did. And this item also requires your vote. Any questions for Mr. Bork? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I failed to get your name. My apologies. It's Chad. No, I know you. Oh. I'm just thinking. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. I have not heard any questions for him as well. Okay. Yes, I know you. Thank you. Sure, it's not David? <laughs> <laughs> He's been Chad ever since I got here. <laughs> I, um, I prefer Austin. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding, huh? <laughs> Alrighty, any, uh, so no further questions. Do we have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I'd move the uh, commission approve the request for reimbursement for the Suffolk Downs Capital Improvement Trust Fund as uh, provided in the meeting packet. Second. Any discussion, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, five zero, thank you. And our last item under racing, 16. So this is, oh. is a uh, request from Suffolk Downs for approval of a racing official. And again, this was a delegated authority. He um, acted as the starter the first weekend. Um, he's been a long time assistant starter. And um, they're just asking for approval 
of um, Eddie Blue Balls as a starter. I believe he might also work the final weekend of Suffolk. When is the final weekend again? The 29th and 30th. Yeah. Yeah. And this weekend and also. Yes, they're racing this weekend. Oh, this weekend as well. Yeah. Two more weekends. Two yeah. more weekends. And I understand that you need a motion on this as well. Correct. This requires a vote. Uh, we? My only question, I guess, is there supposed to be a list attached? Um, his name's right in the um, memo. Just in the letter. Just it's in just the, letter. the one, one okay, person, the one. so okay. there wasn't a separate um, list. Okay. Well, there should be um, a letter from Chip Tuttle in the yeah. 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 It's there. Right. Right. So, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve um, Suffolk Downs' request for a key uh, operating personnel as a racing official, Edward Bubbix. Bubbles? Bolt. Say that again, please. Bubbles. Bubbles. Um, as outlined in the memo. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5 0. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, okay. I think we are now moving to Finance. our budget. Okay. Thank you very much. This would be item four in our original agenda for today. And uh, Chief Finance Accounting Officer Derek Lem Lemon will take over for us. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm joined by Agnes Bollier and Douglas O'Donnell, and we're here to present to you the initial FY20 budget recommendations for the Mass Gaming Commission. Um, I understand it was a strategic move to move us towards the end of the day to keep <laughs> everyone engaged, um, and we appreciate that. Um, in your packet, we are re recommending $43.5 million in spending composed of the following areas. $34.2 million in the Gaming Control Fund, of which $28.4 million is for regulatory costs and $5.78 million is for statutorily required costs. $6.54 million in research and responsible gaming funding, which for the first time will be funded from the Public Health Trust Fund, and $2.75 million in raising costs. In aggregate, this funds 107 FTEs and six contract positions. Once again, we've taken the time to distinguish between regulatory costs, which are the costs the Commission can control, and statutorily required costs. The table on page two provides a little detail behind the $5.78 million in statutory costs, as well as it breaks out the funding the Commission anticipates to receive from the Public Health Trust Fund in FY20. Pages three through seven of the memo compare the FY20 funding recommendations to the currently approved FY19 budget. Once again, I'd like to point out that FY20 will be the first year the Commission will assess our licensees um, for the Public Health Trust Fund. We'll do that at the floor level, which is $5 million. And it'll also be the first um, year that the, public health, that the Research and Responsible Gaming Budget will be funded from the Public Health Trust Fund rather than the Gaming Control Fund. For the purposes of comparing year-over-year -year budgets, the charts and the remainder of the memo total the Gaming Control Fund costs with the Public Health Trust Fund costs and call the combined spending the Gaming and Statutory Cost Funding. That's just so that we can look at apples to apples, even though it's a new breakout this year. The MGC's currently approved FY19 budget for the Gaming Control Fund is $37.85 million, inclusive of research and responsible gaming. The FY20 statutory cost funding recommendation is $40.7 million, which is an approximate 7.64% increase. The MGC's regulatory costs grew by 5.05% from $27 million in FY19 to $28.4 million in FY20. And this is mainly representative of the annualized costs of Boston Harbor, the Encore Boston Harbor facility. While the statutorily required costs grew by 14.12% from $10.8 million in FY19 to $12.3 million in FY20, which are driven by the increase in responsible research and responsible gaming budget for GameSense at Encore Boston Harbor, as well as the Public Health Trust Fund taking on the indirect costs of our research and responsible gaming program, which had previously been funded from the Gaming Control Fund. 
At this point, I'd like to take a little time just to discuss the MGC's process for building the budget. Beginning in February, the MGC's Office of Finance met with each division bureau head within the MGC and developed spending and revenue projections for FY20. The requests were then reviewed by the Finance Office in coordination with the Executive Director and the Treasurer of the Commission. A third review was conducted by represents, representatives of current gaming licensees at a meeting on May 16, 2019 at the MGC office. The meeting included a comprehensive review of the Commission's budget at a line item level and as always was a very con um, constructive and honest back and forth. Pages 5, 6, and 7 of the memo compare each of the MGC's division's FY19 budget to the proposed FY20 budget and offers some details on major year-over-year -year increases or decreases. For example, while the statutory costs of the MGC funded from the gaming, sorry, not the statutory, while the regulatory costs of the MGC funded from the gaming control fund are increasing by 1.36, um, the actual annualization of public safety and gaming costs of Encore Boston Harbor are closer to $3.67 million, as you'll see in the um, details of the IEB's budget. Those those increases are offset partially by the legal cost being driven down by over $2 million, as well as the um, IT cost being driven down by over a half million based on the one-time cost that they had to start up the Encore Boston Harbor facility. The racing division remained pretty consistent year over year with a modest 1.24% increase projected in FY20. Um, and it would be ill it advise me not to point out that the FY20 budget proposal does include a few funding exposures. First, the MGC is only budgeted for the bare minimum required by our insurance carrier for litigation costs. You'll see in the legal division, our budget de decreased by over $2 million for, um, for legal costs. We've also included a full year of revenue for Suffolk Down simulcasting. That money is uncertain as of January 1st, and Doug can handle a lot of those questions if you have them after this. You mean July 1st? January 1st. January 1st. Oh, that's right. It's a full, that's right. Live raising July 1st Correct. is uncertain. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But the majority of the money that funds the racing division comes from the simulcasting. Mm -hmm. yes. right. um, and finally, we'll move on to the assessment piece um, of the discussion. Chapter 23, and I want to be very clear on this uh, as far as gaming positions and what we use for budgeting purposes versus um, the uh, ombudsman's purposes. Um, chapter 23K, section 56A through C, define how the MGC will fund its annual costs related to gaming and uh, gaming non-racing activities. This chapter was further defined through 205 CMR 121. By taking the projected spending less than net revenues projected for FY20, the Commission will utilize 205 CMR 121.013B to assess approximately $29.8 million on licensees. In addition, per 205 CMR 121.013C, the Commission will, for the first time, assess $5 million to be deposited in the Public Health Trust, public health trust Fund. This will result in a $34.8 million total assessment on our licensees. The way we've chosen to count gaming positions for the purposes of calculating the assessment on licensees is solely based on the number of available seats or positions at a facility, whether it be a slot machine, uh, electronic table game, or a actual table game. And that's the total number of seats that can be occupied and should not be confused at any point with how many people on average or at any given time are at the casino. This is solely for calculating budget purposes as laid out in the section of the general laws and further defined through our regulations. The chart on page 7 breaks out the total number of actual available seats for each casino as of June 1, 2019. Attached to this document, um, you'll find attachment A, which is a uh, spending and revenue projection by appropriation. Attachment B uh, provides a view of each division's budget by object class. And then attachment C provides that same information, but goes first ordered by object class, then by division. If there are any questions, I'd be willing to open up now. Yeah, I, we, um, my conversation with you this week was very helpful in understanding these numbers, so I, I appreciate the opportunity to meet with you and discuss uh, in detail these numbers and what they mean.
No, go, go ahead. I can. Well, I was, I was just going to actually um, emphasize some of the things that you already mentioned that are worth of noting. Um, the point that we, this is the first year we are assessing the five, the statutorily uh, assessment of the to the public health trust fund of uh, five million. But as per the MOU that we have with uh, uh, with DPH, um, we will be uh, funding six point five million dollars of research and responsible gaming uh, activities. The balance coming from the actual gaming um, taxes that flow into that. Um, which is, I think, worthy of noting. Um, another uh, another uh, thing that you mentioned is uh, the legal fees. Even though the um, the increase um, in the regulatory costs um, is, is whatever it is, the 1.3 million dollars that you highlighted, uh, there is still some uncertainty relative to next year's legal fees, just like there was last year, uh, and uh, based on, however all those activities develop, uh, we will likely come back and um, ask for our revision or uh, supplemental uh, quarterly uh, funding requests as, as time evolves. Uh, but it's, it's, it's in good context as, as, you, as you put it uh, here. Um, the overall comment is that uh, any one of these costs are, I think, appropriate. In the aggregate, we are trending uh, on the expensive side. And one thing that we should look to as we now transition into a uh, regulatory mode is to look at how we'll continue to look for efficiencies and opportunities um, in, in the context of everything we do. Um, I just wanted to put that out there because it's something that we constantly think about it internally uh, may not necessarily talk a lot about it in, in, in this uh, format, but um, it's necessary for us to continue thinking about in those terms uh, because it's, um, it's, I think it's appropriate. By the way, there's a third uh, category that we simply don't control that is also part of this, uh, of this budget. And I should, I should um, mention um, the Attorney General's Office, the ABCC, um, the state police that is, that's assigned to the Attorney General's office, um, as well as um, the indirect cost, are all areas that we've tried to weigh in, especially on the indirect cost. We don't believe we should be uh, paying for it, but it's something that we have not gotten any, any traction in that regard, and we'll continue to assess the licensees because that's our only recourse. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as a side point to what you just talked about, Commissioner, I know we have a a total kind of top to bottom uh, a debrief, however we want to phrase that, coming up. Uh, certainly we needed to get through an opening and we continue to assess our risk and what resources we need in order to regulate um, appropriately um, with new information. And um, I know that's something uh, the team has talked about doing in the near future and I, I think that's a very valuable exercise. Mm -hmm. I, no, go ahead. I, I, I would just highlight, uh, again, this is well put together. Um, I do appreciate the, the blurb about you know, the FY20 budget proposals and some exposures we might have. And you're talking about simulcasting. We just heard about local aid payments related to simulcasting. And maybe at some point um, for a meeting down the line, we need to talk about the bigger picture of racing once again and kind of where it's going and what direction it might be leading. Um, but I think that's a, a conversation, I guess, probably for Agenda 7. Two questions and one point. Um, in terms of the legal fees, uh, we've um, You've explained to us that we right now are carrying in the budget just that low threshold of, I think it's 400000 correct? But it's my understanding, I think it's important for us to publicly state this, that we are working with the licensees on that, and they are anticipating perhaps um, the need for um, additional amounts that commissioners need to mention. 
and that's actually their preference at this point for us to proceed in that fashion. That's correct. Um, that's actually a strategy that they've asked us to take on for the last two to three years rather than put in a high estimate um, and then come back and hold on to money for the course of the year. They'd prefer to pay it as we see what the anticipated bills are at the end of each quarter. And to the point that uh, Commissioner Zuniga and Commissioner Cameron were making, um, one of the things that our licensees talked to us exactly about was reviewing after opening um, our costs and remaining competitive um, with other regulators as far as what we spend and how we staff. So that is something we really have to pay attention to. Right, and we will want to address how the pr process for that review, um, if we could keep that on our internal list to establish a, a process that suits Derek and team. I'd be remiss to also, and I know you will do this, but to mention your team's um, additions here. But I, uh, before we do that, I'll have a second question. There was at least um, in the last month a little bit of confusion about counting of the gaming positions. And I appreciate today the clarification. And I assume that all three licensees um, are all in agreement with how the assessment process is going with respect to that gaming position count. So they were instrumental in, um, in driving this, this process. So in the past, we had put an arbitrary number onto each type of table game. Um, and what our licensees have said to us is, well, we may want to put a few more around or we want to may, may want to give our guests a little more space, so why don't we just give you an actual count? Um, so we received an actual count. Doug actually reached out to each licensee, received an actual count, reviewed it with um, our gaming agents to make sure it's accurate, and those are the numbers that you'll see in this, in this document. They come right so, from the licensee. We have emails to back them up. That adds a lot of clarity, so thank you very much. That, that does, and I, the only thing that I would just point out is that it was not necessarily an arbitrary number. It was a theoretical yeah. average. Yeah. Um, you know, poker tables that are generally 10 positions. One licensee has, has nine in one case. Those, those kinds of things, which is what you, what you were Or in describing. a high limit area, you may have seven or eight versus yes. the nine or 10 average, so yes. yes. It's, it's the actual. So that's really helpful. If there are no other questions, I think also, um, uh, Derek, that you, the next step is that this budget will now go out for public comment. Do you want to just elaborate on that process and then what you'll expect from us in the future? Yes, yeah, so um, if there are no additional questions or comments, um, next thing we will do is right after this meeting, put our budget out for public comment come back to you um, at the next scheduled commission meeting at least two weeks out. Um, so if it's three weeks out, we'll come to you at that one. Um, bring back any public comments, any issues that we may have, and then ask you to consider um, those changes that may be brought forward. Or if there are no comments of um, substantial items, we would just ask you to approve the budget as proposed. And that's a two-week period. Is that yes. That's yeah. Everyone's comfortable with a two-week public hearing, mm -hmm. and that's yes. been your past practice? Correct. It has been, but it could go out longer than that. Um, so I, I suspect that the meeting at which the commission would take this up might be the last meeting, last week in mm -hmm. June. So I think we could just keep it out um, until, you know, probably two and a half, close to three weeks. And, and the reality is that the most comments, the only comments we've gotten in the past from are from the licensees. Yeah. And that process has already taken quite a bit of uh, a robust uh, uh, time. Uh, so, but, but it's important to put it out for comment and, you know. And then just one last thing I'd like to say is, um, like always, the whole entire team here at the MGC is responsible for generating these numbers. Um, you know, Agnes and Doug work tirelessly. I get to do the presentation and take the credit. Um, but behind Agnes and Doug are their teams, and behind them are each single division uh, director who from day one have owned their own budgets, uh, meet with Agnes on a monthly basis, can give us insight into why they're changing, why they're going up, why they're going down. And has really led us to the place where we can sit in front of you and answer questions or give a good summary of what's happening rather than just a balance sheet exercise or a spreadsheet exercise. So it's been really 
um, nice process compared to other places I've been, um, and people embrace it here. And you know, let me just uh, add, add to that. Uh, I think it's important, that, uh, and, and I think it's uh, it's good to recognize everybody takes it very seriously because the freedom we have to simply assess licensees should be uh, taken very seriously uh, compared to other agencies uh, where they have to go through a uh, legislative appropriation uh, process um, gives us really the luxury, I would argue, of looking at what's really necessary, and that's an important uh, thing to highlight in terms of um, the taking it seriously here and, 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 and having a hard look, not just from the staff, but especially from the commission, as to how we can continue to always realize efficiencies where we can and spend what we think is appropriate for the activities that we believe need to be done. I wholeheartedly agree. Any further questions? Thank you for the thorough, thorough um, presentation. And I should note that Derek is always very generous behind the scene of always commending his, his team and making sure that their contributions are known to me and I think that that's exceptional for you, Derek. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks to everybody. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you. I think that this is an item that's actually on the original agenda, number eight. Um, correct for the legal division. General Counsel Blue, do you want to lead? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. We have before you today amendments to four existing regulations. For items 8A, B, and D, we are asking for your approval to begin the formal promulgation process for those amendments. For item 8C, we're asking for your approval to file this on an emergency basis and begin the formal process as well. We have um, different folks here to present on each one. We were wondering, I know Deputy General Counsel Grossman is there, if we could do item 8D first, because then we could let Mr. O'Toole get back to the track and wow. hey. <laughs> matters there. Wow. I think he was welcoming that. <laughs> so item 8D is the addition of another form of wager to the racing wager regulation. Unlike in gaming, every time we want to add a wager to, to be available to the public and the patrons, we have to change the regulation. So this is just an additional form of wager. Uh, Mr. O'Toole can explain to you what it is. It seems a little complicated to me, but I'm sure he understands it. Sure, thank you. Um, so what we're asking for is just to adopt the AR, uh, ARCI um, recommendations of the model rule for uh, jackpot uh, payoffs. We've had good success with the wicked high five, we call it, it's a pentafecta. Um, and the, the way that the pentafecta is hit at Plain Ridge, it's not just that you pick five horses and five horses come in in that particular order. You do get a payoff for that, but that's a consolation. You have to have the only ticket of all the wagers that pick that correctly, yeah. and then you get the jackpot. So 50% um, when it starts, 50% of the pool gets carried over, or the whole pool, if there's no tickets, gets carried over to the next Pentafecta race. And then that jackpot builds. And uh, we've had $20,000 $20, payoffs, $10,000 payoffs. We just had $8,000 um, last week. So we're, we're in the process now this week of building it back up. So what we want to do here is uh, these are called uh, pick three, pick four, pick five. We have picked the winners of the races in succession, not the first five uh, horses in a particular race, but now you're picking races four through nine, let's say, in a, in a pick five. And then you would have to, and then the same, um, and the same theory applies. You have to be the only ticket. If there's more than one, then you, there's a consolation and half the pool gets carried over. So that's the concept behind the behind the wagers. We have it already in place for the Pentafecta, and it's been successful. And now we want to add the rest of the uh, Racing Commissioners International uh, model rules that govern these, which are uh, already adopted in a lot of places in the regs, uh, to govern the pick, uh, the 
pick four, the pick five, and pick six. We're only going to use it on a, either a pick five or a pick six. We're going to use it on the smaller ones, and it'll only be one, one time a day when, when we do it. That was going to be my question. So pick five and pick six, would you have them cross over days, or they have to be within the same day? It's, it's, it's always consecutive races. So yes. it's always you, you, you can set it up any way that you want. The pick six could be from, from six to eight. I mean, from two to eight. Um, so whatever races you want, you want to make. But they have to be within the same day. You cannot be the last race in one day and then come back the next day to pick the other four. I suppose you could, but it hasn't. Uh, it hasn't been done. I'm hasn't not been sure. done. I'm not sure. I'd have to look at the regs to see if you can do it that way. That would be one way to guarantee to you might be the only back. one. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, to, that you're the only one. Yes. <laughs> but it, it's done right now, industry wide. It's done. People like to miss the we were talking about the fact that maybe um, it, it makes sense to do it the same day because yeah. people want to get those bets in and move on to something else, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, now, it, but they're still captured for future cards and future events if it doesn't get hit. That's the jackpot yes. uh, theory behind yeah, it. Yeah, just, I'm just looking at it from the gambler perspective. If, if I wanted to, uh, to, um, to pick five and there's only three races left in the day, I might not do it unless it, it carried over into the next day. Okay, so the the program is pre-populated with the exact races that yes. we decide that it's going to be. We stay consistent with that. So if you if you came to Plain Ridge next week and you came to play, Plain Ridge three months from now, on that card, the pick five would be you know races four through nine or whatever. It would always be consistent with those races. So you don't get to pick and choose the races. It's a it's a it's a it's a finite number of races in the on the one card and then everyone bets into that one pool for those five races okay and i really like the fact that we are conforming with our ci rules because as we know simulcasting and the betters will understand these are the same rules that other states other jurisdictions have that's a really important piece so i'm i'm well and that that adds to the competitiveness right if people can find certain bets in other places and not in yes. Plain Ridge, there might be a disincentive to, Correct. to to come in or to bet in Plain Ridge. Yeah. Mr. Grossman, can you just explain the process for how the complicated reg is drafted and reviewed and make sure that it works for uh, Mr. O'Toole's team? Because um, uh, you, did you work on the drafting? Oh. Okay. Thank um, you. No, um, Attorney Teresi drafted it. We went to the um, the RCI rules because we have made our RCI our wagers consistent with the RCI rules. So we used their language. We did get the request though from Mr. O'Toole, so we understood what he was looking for. We worked with Director Lightbomb to make sure that was appropriate as well. And so that's how that's how the process has worked. Thank you. Really helpful. So where are we in the process from the beginning? And that's a, that's a unique process, and I thought that was your question, Ma Madam Chair, when it comes to raising. Um, so this will, this will start the formal process. Once we do the hearing, we get the comments, we'll put it out for comment, we'll have a hearing. We will come back to the commission to ask for authorization to file it with the legislature. It will stay with the legislature for 60 days. When we either hear from the legislature or we don't hear and that period runs out, we will come back and ask you for approval to finalize the promulgation. All right. So we need a motion separately for each for the small business impact as well as the, um, uh, to begin the uh, regulation promulgation process. That's correct. Okay. So, Madam Chair, I move that the commission approve the version of the amendments in 205 CMR 6.35 pick and pools as included in the packet and authorize the staff to take all steps necessary to begin the regulation promulgation process. Did we need a motion on the small business impact statement? Well, I was going to do that one second. Well, the, we I think a, that's the, yeah, the first motion, one, right? the first motion that I've drafted motions. The first one is small business, second one is the regulation. Doesn't but right now, you right, you should do small business. Right now, we, first. Do, have, we do have a motion, so we need to. Are, we suge are you suggesting, General Counsel, that we withdraw that motion at this point? Um, yes, we should do the small business impact statement first, and then. So the motion I the withdraw rate. the motion. 
Thank and, you. And I move that the commission approve the small business impact statement for the amendments to 205 CMR 6.35 pick and pulls as included in the packet. Second. I'd like to, um, I want to just point of order, understand that motion because I'm not sure that it's been thoroughly vetted. Are we all set? Do we need any further uh, in input on that particular motion? Does anybody have any questions on this motion on the small business impact? I, okay, I don't. based on your review of the document. Right, which is why I gave the other motion well, first because we I had understand. just discussed it. I understand. Okay. Well, it doesn't impact small businesses. Uh, because it impacts um, plain wage more than anything else. That's right. No questions on it? Um, Mr. Grossman, do you have anything to add? No, that's okay, great. Adequate. Thank you. Um, there are no further questions. And those in favor? Aye. 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 And those opposed? I'm going to abstain on that. Thank you. I just don't feel um, completely comfortable on understanding the small business impact piece. I feel more comfortable on the next one. So thank you. Just a product of me being relatively new. So four one, thank you. Abstention. So, Madam Chair, I will uh, make the second motion and move that the commission approve the version of the amendments to 205 CMR 6.35 pick in pools as included in the packet and authorize the staff to take all steps necessary to begin the regulation promulgation process. Second. Any further questions on that? Okay, those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, commissioners. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Next, we have item 8A. And we have Deputy General Counsel Grossman here to present on that, those amendments. Good afternoon. There um, are now a series of three proposed changes to three separate sections of the regulations. One of them, uh, Madam Chair, actually does impact small businesses. So we can get into uh, that in a little more detail when we get there. The first and the, the third item that we'll discuss, though, we will, would submit do not have any impact on small businesses as they really just pertain to the operation of the casino itself and to the third one <clears throat> relative to patrons as well, neither of which are small businesses, so really weren't the focus of that section of the law that requires the commission to consider uh, impacts on small businesses before amending regulations. Uh, with that said, the, the first uh, proposal pertains to progressive controllers. Uh, Scott Helwig has joined me up here to help explain to you what a progressive controller is, if that is um, uh, helpful here. But I would just kick it off by noting that the proposal here um, is intended to clarify the existing requirements um, as they pertain to the physical security of progressive controllers that are uh, that relate to certain slot machines within the casino. We do have an existing regulation that addresses this. There have been some questions about the application of that section, so in an effort to clarify that, we have uh, uh, collaborated on this uh, language that we have before you here today. Um, you'll note um, that the new language addresses directly external, uh, I'm sorry, um, integrated progressive controllers that the existing language does not address and that was the source of some of the questions that we were receiving uh, so it's our uh, suggestion that the the new language though similar to the existing language just really clarifies uh, the rule relative to the security of progressive controllers if there are no questions um, we, we can certainly move this just through the, the process, allow um, all of the gaming licensees to comment on it. I believe Mr. Helwig has already shared this language with the gaming licensees, and there really wasn't too much uh, of a response. Uh, Mr. Grossman, when you say there was um, questions, were those questions from licensees that were just unclear? 
Hi, Commissioners and Madam Chairman. Um, yeah, that was the uh, the, the initial um, questions from the the, uh, the properties was just a, a clarification of whether um, how they handle internal or integrated uh, progressive controllers because there was language about external controllers. So they just wanted some clarification on how to address internal controllers. So those were the questions that were coming from the property on so how to this, address that. You, you believe this new language really does clarify? Yes. And um, you've already discussed it with our licensees? Yes, and they have commented back that it is much clearer to them now and, and, and a lot more easy to understand. Okay. I, have, I had a question about the stricken language. When you have, um, whenever the progressive controller and or bank controller has been accessed, written notification shall be provided to the commission. And in the replacement language, it talks about you can't access without first giving written notice to the commission, but are, is anything being lost by sort of accidental or mal, you know, malfeasance leading to access? Is, was that supposed to be a notification of some sort of breach to us that's disappearing in the revision? Um, no, n no, it, it, they should actually be contacting the IAB every time they do go to access a, a progressive controller. Um, so maybe we can look at that language and if we need to clarify it a little bit. Because it seems like they're not quite apples okay. to apples, the stricken with the replacement. Take a look at that, absolutely. Right, one was one was after and the other one is a priori. Or Correct. And know. my question is, is there some sort of additional mandate to give written notification if there's some sort of you know, either breach or inadvertent access? Uh -huh. The other one just says you shall not without asking first, but what if there's some other access? How would that you're saying it's sort of understood they give notice, but it's not clear from Well, this would be only the beginning of the process, right? We could always clarify that in between the promulgation. We can because we will be looking for comments and yeah. we can make that change as part of any changes we make for comments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so we can begin the process mm -hmm. and then take that into consideration? Yes, we can. I guess, is there an issue with taking that stricken sentence and adding it in at this point as we move forward? Or would we just make note that my question is part of the formal comment process that needs to be addressed at the next stage? I think we'll we'll procedurally we, we are covered. being asked to vote on the version in front of us, but I think you've raised a, a point that perhaps many of us understand. Should we amend it now yeah. to reflect Commissioner O'Brien's input, or do you need time to digest that? I think we can do it either way. Um, it's oftentimes easier to take all comments at once and make all of the changes so you as a commission can see what those changes are. Right. But we can certainly make your change now and do other changes later after the comment period, whichever you prefer. I think the okay. difference is, is that we're being asked to vote on this version and I think maybe there could be a process to say vote on this version as amended as opposed to viewing Commissioner O'Brien's comment as a as a comment, <laughs> it's I, obviously a comment. I mean, we here. could take what I could do is move to go, move forward on this with that. Read, and I'll read that stricken mm -hmm. language in as the closing sentence. Yes, and then we can just go forward with comment and, from there. And of course, yes. and, we, and, and if it does it create a problem, then right. Mm -hmm. right. And the reason why I like that is that then at least the public will be commenting on the version that we actually, you know, vote mm -hmm. voted on. Good point. Does that make sense? That makes total okay. sense. Does. If if that doesn't cause a you want to make the motion? Let, um, are we done? With are, if there are any other uh, questions or perhaps suggestions, I think, um, Mr. Grossman, do you have a suggestion on where we would insert the language? If I would suggest we just strike the last sentence in the red and replace it with the, the sentence that addresses it above. Uh, my, my inclination is to add the stricken sentence because I feel like they do two separate things. One is to ask for affirmative permission in advance. The other one, I think, speaks to whether there's some sort of breach. And so what I propose to do is move, make the motions with basically amending by adding the sentence whenever progressives have been accessed as the final sentence. And then that can go up for comment. And if it comes back that they can be reconciled or stricken, then we can deal with it at that point. OK. So simply add that sentence to the end of the Are there further questions on this one? 
And and we again discussed this motion too. Do we want to have a discussion on the small business impact statement before we vote on this? Or do we have do you want to present? I mean I would I would just note I, I really uh, don't think that this change will impact small businesses in any way. If you think about the universe of who this is addressed to, it's the staff at the casino who would have any involvement with uh, slot machines or progressive devices, and the casino itself is not a small business in any way. Um, it certainly impacts our staff, um, and we are not a, a small business in any way. Um, I don't really think it um, in any way impacts um, the manufacturers of progressive devices, but even they wouldn't be considered small businesses. These are huge multinational corporations. So I, I think you'll see in the draft statement before you, we indicate that there's no impact, or it doesn't appear that, we never say there's never. We say it doesn't appear that there's any impact um, that would be created on any small businesses. And I think that's fair in this particular case. I don't think this is the type of regulation that that statute was really concerned with. And can you remind me, is this filed with the Secretary of State's office? Yes, it is. It, it gets filed along with the notice with of the, our reg change. Okay, I just wanted to and it's sure published part of the in the regulatory national process register. that that's a, a requirement of that goes with the process. Okay, excellent. And for context, that has been our experience with most of the most of the regulations we promulgated. That, that's there absolutely are, there right. Are, there are some, you know, the hearing regs, for example, do impact uh, small businesses in some cases, but that's a lot of the regulations that we promulgate on licensees is just what, commission, what it, um, Mr. Grossman articulated. I'm not questioning the impact. I was actually wanting, wanting to be reminded of the process of filing. Oh, I see. Because okay. I, I, I haven't really looked at this for probably four years, so right. thank you. So it gets filed with the Secretary of State's office as part of our formal regulatory um, process. Yes, and it gets published in the Mass Register along with our notice of hearing, so everyone can see what we've said about uh, the small business impact. And then, just to fast forward, at the end of the process, after the public hearing, when we come back before you to have a look at the final draft language, there's what's called an amended small business impact statement where you answer it's seven similar but slightly different questions to see whether your, um, your view of any impact on small businesses has changed throughout the process. And again, that gets filed with the secretary as well. So um, really the statute's designed just, of course, so you take a real close look at any impact that a change is going to have on small business, which is not to say you can't have any impact on no, small no, business. No. You just need to think about it. Right. Thank you. Thanks for the reminder. I appreciate it. Okay, so um, I believe that the legal team's looking for um, a couple of motions. So I don't believe I need to amend as to the small no. business. I can read motion one would be that I move the commission approve the small business impact statement for amendments to 205 CMR 143.02F progressive gaming devices. Um, and that statement being included in the packet, captioned small business impact statement. Second. Any further questions? Thank you again for the assistance in understanding the process. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0, please. And Madam Chair, I further move that the commission um, approve the version of the amendments to 205 CMR 143.02F progressive gaming devices as included in the packet, but as amended to have the concluding sentence read, whenever the progressive controller and or bank controller has been accessed, written notification shall be provided to the commission and authorize the staff to take all steps necessary to begin the regulation promulgation process. Second. Any further questions on that? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Government five zero. Thank you. Item number 8B is an amendment to our definition section. These are definitions to clarify veteran-owned businesses, minority businesses, and women-owned businesses. Commissioner Stebbins, you may want to speak a little bit to these definitions and the changes we're making. Um, sure. Thank you. The, uh, as 
we're all probably familiar, the gaming statute, again, created priority engagement of our licensees with minority business enterprises, uh, women-owned business enterprises, and veteran business enterprises. Uh, as we quickly found out, there were certification processes in place, uh, primarily through the Mass Supplier Develop Supplier Diversity Office, uh, for minority and women. However, there was really no uh, suitable certification for veteran-owned enterprises. Um, so until uh, our friends at the Supplier Diversity Office came up with a process for certifying a veteran business enterprise, uh, we were putting ourselves a little bit at risk by trying to do it internally. Thankfully now, because SDO has come up with a process, uh, it takes about a month, it's free of charge to whoever the BBE <laughs> is, uh, I thought it was a good idea to kind of memorialize this, as well as memorialize uh, the certifi certifying agencies or organizations that also do this kind of work, because some have been through one certifying agency and maybe not another, uh, but it does give our licensees and us some level of comfort that the numbers they report to us are actual business with MBEs, business with VBEs, or business with WBEs. So kind of memorializing that process and those entities uh, I think is really helpful. That's right, and I'd be happy to just piggyback on Commissioner Stevens' remarks and just uh, add that where this fits into the, the process now, these definitions actually exist in the regulations in Section 138, which is the construction oversight section. In order to bridge the gap into operations, we're proposing that they be migrated also over to the definition section, which would make them applicable to, for example, uh, Section 139, where we talk about the periodic and annual reports that the gaming licensees have to file uh, relative uh, uh, to the provision of goods and services, for example, and the amount of dollars contracted with and spent and actually paid to these uh, assorted business enterprises. So this will really just somewhat tie up a loose end um, in the regulations and, and ensure that we have clear definitions for what we mean by uh, these types of business enterprises on, in an ongoing uh, fashion. I, I, I would just add, um, anecdotally, we know some of our licensees are doing business uh, with, let's say, maybe professed business categories that fit under this. However, our licensees can't count them until they go through a recognized certification process. So I think at the end of this, we ought to think about how we communicate that out to everybody we have in our, our, our licensed or registered vendor base, just so they're aware that they probably can't be counted until they subscribe to the, the certification standards as well. Yeah, the enforcement and application is certainly a big piece of this. Um, Madam Chair, just to your earlier uh, comments, there's certainly an impact here on small businesses, as many of these entities are, in fact, small businesses. Uh, I believe what we've said in the small business impact statement, though, is that uh, essentially this is an entirely voluntary process. It is a process that's essentially set out by the Supplier Diversity Office. Um, and by our inclusion of these definitions in the regs, we are not ourselves uh, creating any new uh, requirements or, or burdens or hurdles that don't already exist elsewhere, uh, and that we're really just trying to ensure that there's a uniform way that we can in account uh, and give credit to uh, certain companies in these types of situations. It just, uh, since you brought up the small business impact statement, I got two questions or points under question two, which talks about the state that projected reporting, record keeping, and other administrative costs. This third sentence down, the proposed definition requires presentation of the commission by a vendor of the applicable recognition from an existing government agency process. We have it a little broader because there are non-government agencies that offer that 
certification, so I think we need to amend it to okay. reference them as well. Uh, the next line you do say is that there are no costs associated with the actual commission process. And just give me a little clarification of that because some of these outside organizations do charge. Uh, SDO does not as a service to Massachusetts businesses. And if somebody comes to us for licensing or registration, there's a cost to the business for doing that as well. So I'm just looking as to what you were suggesting in that short sentence. <coughs> but you could say there is a cost at some touch, different touch points. I think we should clarify that. I would start by saying, I would I'd say though that the intent was to say that by including these definitions in the definition section, there was really no additional cost um, involved in this certification process, as we already have a certification process. Um, but your point is certainly well taken, particularly as it applies to outside organizations that you might have to go to uh, for certification. So we will clarify that later. It is based on my experience that the reason why they reached out to these other non-governmental entities was really to streamline the process as well as that. So it's actually helping. But the, to the extent that they do charge a, a fee, um, again, the process helps the vets, I believe, um, alleviates. So. Uh, in, in, in some of the organ other organizations who we worked with do charge a fee and offer <coughs> additional services, services resources on top of that which you know SDO has some pretty defined priorities of what they need to get done. Yeah. I think that that uh, whole process has been received uh, with great success but that's a good amendment and then the other the other one with respect to existing governmental agency process that's just a quick nit. Um, do we have to address costs in the uh, small business in, uh, statement? Is that one of the? Uh, yeah, I think yeah, that's it does the say costs. Question. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we'll need to. Right. So how would? Um, <clears throat> do you have recommended language right now that we could act on? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, um, <clears throat> for a clarification, Commissioner Stevens, were you mm -hmm. stating too that the commission, in fact? imposes any of its own well, I, I was, uh, costs. Well, I was looking for some clarification because if you do apply to be a registered or licensed vendor, you do. That one I do. Us. I understand. That's not our. I just don't know if, if what you were referencing was the certification process and what whether the commission puts a price tag. Yeah, it was really the certification because the the fact that you have to pay a fee to become registered as a vendor is not really up for okay. discussion okay. here. That's okay. already in place, and that is the, the process. This Could is we really say that the commission does not impose any costs? Would that sure. be helpful? Sure. Yeah. And then it's to the extent that the certification process has some kind of you know, incidental costs, then we've covered it. Right. Is that what the um, Secretary of State's office is looking for in terms of with that? Or do we need to say... Um, mentioned that the SDO may have. Well, I mean, just to to be clear, the Secretary of State's office doesn't really monitor any of. No, this. but they I think they developed the. Um, it's it's the, the statute that talks of, that asks the question, right. and I it, think we it's our obligation just to be answer the question fairly so people understand uh, what impacts we think they are. So I think it would be fair to clarify that point that this process does not create any new. Costs, though of course there may be costs associated with becoming certified. You, I mean, if you wanted to amend to to Commissioner Stevens' point, where it talks about um, it ends with government agency process, you could amend it to say or um, similar private organization, yeah. or and then you can conclude that paragraph to say because it says in there no costs associated with the actual commission process. If you added a sentence that says, we note, however, private organizations may charge a free for such designation, then I think you've addressed sort of the gap that the private designation may cost something, but it's not associated with others. Right. Do you want to uh, clarify that the commission does not? I, I, I mean, it, he says does, it says there are no costs associated with the actual oh, commission he, process. The commission process. So he does, yeah, yeah. it's covered in the draft that, that Attorney Horstman submitted. 
we would just it would just be further clarifying if you add the private organization reference you just note that they may charge I think that's appropriate so why don't we uh, if we don't have any further questions or um, discussion for legal shall we move first on the small business impact statement um, Madam Chair, I move the Commission approve the Small Business Impact Statement um, for the amendments to 205 CMR 102.02 definitions as included in the packet um, with amendments to um, number two's response to add the, the words or similar private organization following the phrase government agency process and to further conclude that paragraph with the sentence, we note, comma, however, comma, that private organizations may charge a fee for such designation, period. Second. Second. Any further questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Five zero, please. And that motion, two, do we have any further questions or comments? <coughs> um, the actual uh, proposed regulatory change. No, all set. All right. Do we have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I move the commission approve the version of the amendments to 205 CMR 102.02 definitions as included in the packet and authorize the staff to take all steps necessary to begin the regulation promulgation process. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5 0. Okay, now we're on 8C. Item number 8C is amendments to the excluded persons regulation. And just um, a little refresher this is the list that the Commission puts people on as opposed to the voluntary excluded list. These are, this is the regulation where we have a process whereby the IEB makes a determination as to who may be appropriate to put on this list. They have notice and opportunity to be heard. We are asking the Commission to approve these changes by emergency so that we can have them in place before the opening of Encore. Um, we have made changes to this regulation in the past, and these are just sort of minor changes so that we can make sure it's ready to go. Um. I do have a question, and I remember we uh, we talked about these in the past, um, and I and I understand that some of these amendments are to further align with our hearing regulations more than anything else. Um, but the one thing I um, I want to ask um, on the 15207, the petition to remove the name from the exclusion list. The request now goes to the Bureau as opposed to the Commission. Why was that necessary? Can you remind me? Well, it goes to the Bureau, and then the Bureau lets the Commission know we have a hearing. So, we so the Commission the still has the hearing, yes. Okay. Because the, the other way around, putting them in the list needed to go to the Bureau for all kinds of other reasons, um, but it didn't have to come to the Commission? Well, so when the, when the IB makes a determination, and I'll let Mr. Grossman correct me here too, they send the letter out. The person then has the ability to ask for a hearing in front of the Commission. If they don't ask for a hearing within the specified time, they will end up on the list. If they do, then they'll have a hearing and the commission will decide whether they're on the list or not. Yeah, that's on the front end. That's on the front end. This is if someone wants to come off. Yes. Um, and I think when we looked at this the last time, we wanted to clarify that process for letting people come off. I don't think our process was as clear. So this would be the person themselves requesting to come off. The bureau would get the request and then there would be a request to the commission for a hearing on the removal. Right now, if you read the entire section, it looked like Bureau needed to be replaced with Commission because otherwise the process didn't really make sense. They would come to us to request, but it still lay with the Bureau to make the finding, the hearing, 
and then Anita Nile comes back to us. So it's more of a ministerial correction, I think, to make the rest of the section okay. make the process okay. follow along. Fair enough. And, and, I, and I presume it's aligned with the hearing regs, yes. and that yes. must be how it is. Yes. Well, this has the statute has a separate requirement for hearings on this particular issue, but yes, we've aligned it up as closely as we can given the statutory requirements for it. So it is the hearing is with the commission, for example. Right. Yes. yes. Right. And Attorney Grossman, I know you've worked with Attorney Lilios on this, and that the IEB is in agreement with these changes, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. And again, the reason why we need this to be an emergency on a basis, that's we have to vote today for an emergency basis. Could you explain that? Sure. I think the, the theory would be that <coughs> if we're about to start putting people on the list, which hasn't really started in earnest yet, that it would be most fair for those individuals to know exactly what the process is. Um, and if we wait, in they potentially there, there could be a change to the process by which they would go about getting on the list, coming off the list, the whole thing, even though they're not really major changes. So that's it the just reason. Be final. So right. this would allow IEB and, and the Gaming Commission to continue to operate under the emergency regulation, but it will still go out in full uh, promulgation rules, and and uh, it could be changed. Yes. Yeah, so procedurally, the way it would work is that if you were to approve this by emergency, it would go into effect immediately. Um, we would then commence the formal promulgation process as we ordinarily would with these others, uh, have a public hearing, et cetera, et cetera, and then you'll have a chance and people will have a chance to comment and you can vote on the final version within the 60 to 90 days or whenever it is. Mm -hmm. So that gives us an opportunity for Shazunita to look yep. more carefully, yep. if that makes sense. I'm, I'm happy myself with the explanation that you provided, Commissioner, because I think it's, it's appropriate. Um, if I may add uh, context that I did ask uh, Attorney Lilius for, there's uh, only 11 people in this list currently, mm -hmm. and uh, it's mostly people who have been referred to the Bureau from the Attorney General's Office mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Division uh, of Gaming, mm -hmm. the, 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 the gaming people. But, it does but, also appear to add some teeth to if the licensee fails to, yes, you know, cooperate and add. No, knowingly or recklessly, yeah. That's a, that's already there, so it says it again. It's in a different section. Okay, so but it's at, it's new to 152.066, correct? It yes, it's new it's where it is. Yes. Right. And the small impact. The small business impact statement is the same as others in which it doesn't affect small business. That's right. It only affects our licensees, um, the commission, and individuals. Mm -hmm. Any further questions or discussion? We have a motion on the impact statement. I move that the commission, uh, Madam Chair, I move that the commission approve the small business impact statement for the amendments to 205 CMR 152 individuals excluded from the gaming establishment as included in the packet. Second. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Five zero. And uh, Do Madam we need to approve on an emergency basis or does this Yes does our language cover no, well, the motion has motion language so. for the emergency not basis. For the yes. Right. But but not for the impact statement. So does that matter? No. That doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Then, Madam Chair, I would move that the Commission approve the amendments to the 205 CMR 152 individuals excluded from a gaming establishment as included in the packet and authorize the staff to file the regulation on an emergency basis pursuant to Chapter 23K Section 5B and further to take the steps necessary to file the regulation with the Secretary of the Commonwealth and to proceed with a formal regulation promulgation process. Second. Any further discussion, questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.
Now, com Commissioner, updates. Item number nine. Do we have any today? Uh, I have two quick ones. Uh, again, I had the chance to go to the uh, the gaming school graduation on Saturday, which was a lot of fun. Uh, I, I, I would just um, suggest that uh, they weren't all necessarily young graduates who were in the crowd. They were people at all points in their life, whether it was they had retired from a previous job and were looking for a new challenge or opportunity, but we, we had one graduate who showed up legitimately in the full cap and gown uh, outfit to be part of the ceremony, so it was, uh, it was rewarding. Um, the other item, uh, we have, I've had some continual outreach with the Department of Elder Affairs with respect to um, the work they do to protect elders across the Commonwealth, and obviously we know that uh, uh, elderly population in Massachusetts enjoys going to our casinos. So we had a great conversation uh, with folks from Elder Affairs, uh, with Mark Vanderlyn and myself, one to talk about things like uh, Game Sense, Play My Way, Voluntary Self-Exclusion List is things that uh, their network could be aware of as we get ready to open another casino. We also had an opportunity or will have an opportunity to uh, maybe educate our Game Sense employees on what to do if they see an elderly person in distress, calling elderly protective services. Uh, my hope is if that training goes well, it might be something that we could also extend to our gaming agents and the GE unit as well as security at, uh, at our licensees. So, uh, first step is for Game Sense, uh, the new Game Sense team, to maybe do a training and maybe do it in time before uh, Encore opens. Commissioner Zuniga, do you want to talk about your Nevada trip? Yes, yes, I do. I um, I had um, I went to the gambling and risk taking conference last week that took place in Las Vegas. It takes place every three years. This is the premier really um, uh, research, evaluation, um, and um, conference uh, has been taking place, um, I mentioned 17 uh, times, uh, again every three years. Um, it's sponsored by UNLV and it congregates a lot of what people from around the world who are doing research, evaluation, and other responsible gaming um, activities. Um, there were, uh, Massachusetts continues to be featured prominently there. Our own Mark van der Linden was part of two um, sessions. Rachel Volberg and um, Rob Williams are two um, principal investigators, were themselves part of two other uh, sessions, um, as well as the Division of Addiction, um, Cambridge Health Alliance. Um, they also have a session all talking about what Massachusetts is doing. Uh, some of it is, uh, is uh, including also the Mass Council on Responsible Game, uh, the Massachusetts Council on Problem Gambling also led another session. The point being is that our efforts um, are prominently featured in this conference um, and that, that again draws from uh, people around the world. Um, and it's a small community, but it's in, an, an influential uh, community of researchers and uh, people who do this, um, notably from Europe and Canada and are very interested in um, responsible gaming and the like. One, uh, the keynote speaker in this conference was uh, Becky Harris. And she talked about, the, she's a former chair of the Nevada Gaming Control Board. Um, her speech was interesting and timely, and I'm the, my main update here, uh, because it was a reflection on her tenure which was a little bit more than a year, but it was bookended by the developments of um, Win Resorts um, because uh, she, she talked about how uh, she was there two days, two or three days in her job when the January 21st article in the Wall Street Journal came to be. Mm -hmm. um, it was a very powerful speech. She. Um, she went through what Nevada has gone through, the Nevada Gaming Control Board, and if I can do justice and trying to summarize it, um, 
it is a, a, a healthy discussion as to whether and how the, the, the Gaming Control Board could recommend regulations to the Commission to address, uh, to, to, to address this notion of sexual harassment on the gaming companies that they regulate. There was two schools of thought that she described that there was already enough in the existing statutes and regulations to address these matters like many others. And there was others who thought, like she did, to include regulations into, um, in, into the, the, the scheme here. Um, the, vote, uh, the, the board voted ultimately unanimously to recommend those regulations. Mm -hmm. The way she describes that is that this now puts the onus into the gaming companies to uh, certify to the regulators that they're in compliance mm -hmm. with, uh, with these um, regulations. Uh, as opposed to in the past, which was one in which the individual would have to come forward uh, and uh, in order to, for, for anything to really um, take effect. I should note that um, despite the vote of the Gaming Control Board, they still would have to adopt them uh, at the commission mm -hmm. level, so um, that's forthcoming. I don't know what the outcome will be. It will be interesting for us to to, to look at that. Um, and um, if we ever, I, I know there's been some discussions here as to we wanted to, uh, Commissioner Cameron, we wanted to uh, look into um, processes or our own evaluation in general of our gaming licensees. Uh, and I wanted to, again, offer Actually that. On our agenda. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I, I've had the uh, opportunity on a, a couple of occasions to speak to uh, Becky Harris about um, these uh, these matters. These uh, she gave a full presentation in, in um, Copenhagen last year, and um, we have we have a working group here to take a look at similar matters to see if uh, we in fact need to make changes. No decisions have been made yet, but it's a, it's a robust working group with lots of um, um, lots of informed opinions, and um, we we really felt like we needed to get through our earlier decisions before we move forward so that group will be uh, and you working and again. Commissioner O'Brien are on that together. Yes, thank correct. You. As well as a number of staff members. So, yes. um, but thank you. I, 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 I'm aware of her, how strongly she feels about the issues and, um, and um, she does have some very interesting points to be made on the subject. And I believe uh, either the transcript or a tape of, of those presentations will be available, and I will right. point them to Great. you whenever, whenever, um, whenever we can get our hands on. Um, there are other items that I just highlight quickly um, that bring home, um, mostly because of, of the work that we've been doing. There's people out there looking at technology to improve responsible gaming, apps, notifications, etc. It's something that we've done in, the, in our own version here with Play My Way, but it's something that we should continue looking at. Um, there are uh, people struggling with uh, voluntary, regional voluntary self-exclusion. There's a big effort in Europe to try to do that. It's something that our statute directs us to explore as well because of the uh, size and, and, and density and geography of, the, of, of gaming in New England. Um, and I, we, I could emphasize, uh, I could relate to those struggles because it has not been entirely successful in uh, our prior efforts to put together a regional, a regional voluntary self-exclusion list. Um, but uh, Europe is looking hard at it. Uh, and most notably, and this dovetails into the GameSense program, there has been, um, there, there was this great, very interesting session about the effectiveness of brief interventions. Um, there, is, uh, there is some um, um, really uh, hopeful uh, uh, evidence that they provide um, a, a marginal benefit. Uh, there's real um, opportunity relative to the cumulative effect of those brief interventions. And the whole point is that they are also very cost effective. Um, and, uh, and that really goes to the core of the Game Sense program. Uh, so I could really as well identify well with them. So overall, a great uh, conference. Uh, uh, again, I will try to um, get Mark to uh, perhaps summarize or make available 
the most notable sessions uh, in case anybody's interested. Mr. Cameron, do you have an update? Commissioner O'Brien? Do I have a motion? I move to adjourn. Second. Second. Those in favor? Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Thank you.